fun. All right, guys. We are streaming live episode 18, The Team House. This is our first time, Dave, is this our first time having in-studio guests? I think it is. No, we've had Jim West here, we've had- That's right, that's right, had Jim Clint and Clint. Foreman. Yeah. yeah, so, uh, but it is- Our it, first four-way. It, 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 it is our first four-way. It is our first four-way, so. <laughs> in a, in a uh, dungeon in Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah, but a really nice dungeon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. that. And we're all wearing, I mean, we. Oh, Jesus. we coordinated this. Thing. Yeah, don't, don't we, yeah, I was really telling good. don't we look like puppeteers at like a Jim Henson <laughs> set right now? Like, or like the background people, like stagehands? Yeah. All wearing black. Um, but I've been calling this the uh, Redheaded Stepchildren of Special Operations show because our two guests <laughs> are from. Josh from Civil Affairs and Zach from PSYOP. Yep. Or we're, it's not, we're not allowed to call it PSYOPs, it's PSYOP. Because you guys are just doing one PSYOP at a time. Is it time. MISO? No, no, we're not allowed to say that either. No. Wait, no, we gotta what are we allowed to say? Uh, it used to be me for a little while they changed it to MISO, which was Military Intelligence Source Operations. Military Information Support Operations. Gotcha. Yeah, but MISO lends itself to way too many jobs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I think that's why they had to change it. Um, I'm just posting our stuff since, uh, yeah. So, I mean, before we like, I want to get into like your guys's personal experiences in the military and all of that. Um, and, and some really funny stories before this, we were talking about, um, we had, uh, I, I was doing, uh, making a video recording with Josh telling a pretty funny story about. Uh, Congolese hookers, and that'll be uh, that's actually going to be like an exclusive story for people who support the stream. Um, but before we, wait, 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 you have to tell them how if you support us on Patreon and welcome everybody to Team House episode 19? 18. 18. 18. 18. Team House episode 18? Yes, and the, Murphy and the link for that if you want to support the stream, get, uh, get some skin in the game, it's down below. That's right. And there's a bunch of exclusive interviews that I've posted with Special Forces veterans I've interviewed. And now Josh, you're the inaugural civil affairs bro on there telling Congo stories, <laughs> war stories, if you will. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to first get into um, what is CA and what is PSYOP for people who are like, yeah, I know what Green Berets are, I know what Rangers are, I know what SEALs are. But these are two components that they're both under USASOC. Well, yeah, kind of. It, so USAKPOC is the the, um, the parent support, or the, what did you say, the, uh, it's weird. It's like a weird kind of one-all yeah. encompassing USAKPOC, civil affairs and PSYOPs fall underneath it, and that's it. Uh, originally, civil affairs and PSYOP uh, all across the board, active duty, Reserve all fell under use aside for a long time. Doctrinally, they still do. Reserve split off uh, for their funding purposes only to reserve uh, command. Um, and then CA has now grown out into brigades all throughout the country. CA reserve special operations still too, or doctrinally. Because PSYOP is not. It's not. No. I, I believe it's doctrinally. I don't know. I mean, I've been out for a long time, but. Uh, <clears throat> oh yeah, so civil affairs is a it's a weird thing. It's uh it's probably one of the weirder units in the military because it's like a unit that has a lot of different resources at its disposal. Um kind of doing the hearts and minds things. After 9-11 in Afghanistan, there was a lot of units, the CA units that were deployed there going into formerly held Taliban areas to provide support, but they're gonna give them like fresh drinking water or some shit like, uh, you know, just bringing in pallets, MREs or whatever stuff. People are like in dire need, um, which is where civil affairs makes its money. But I was, in the last couple of days, I'm going back and looking at a lot of stuff and the capabilities of civil affairs, if used properly, can be a combat multiplier for the ground commander from a conventional unit or a special operations forces unit um, because they have the capability and the training to go in and work with the local government, the local tribal government, the local police, the local military. They kind of work. 
all around and they kind of make up their mission as they go. And that's kind of like really what I saw firsthand in 2004, 2005 when I was there. Because before 9-11, <clears throat> civil affairs kind of deployed to places like peace operations in Central America, and wartime operations in Central America like uh, Panama and Grenada and then Haiti. Um, but for the longest time, all they really did was like Kosovo and Bosnia. And, and that was really what I got the impression. I knew guys that were on those missions. But what I got the impression was that was like a one year excuse to go out and get fucking drunk. <laughs> like, like, that's all it was. I didn't know any dude that was on any of those fucking missions that took away any knowledge or real life, you know, takeaways. Not a lot of, uh, yeah, not a lot of uh, kind of pass me down information from the next generation. None. No. Like, oh yeah, we, like, if you want to have the best meal, you got to go to Kosovo. <laughs> they bring it in their house and they got lots of vodka and fucking beer. And I'm like, that doesn't really sound like a mission. That just sounds like my house on a Saturday. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but there's per diem, right? Yeah, yeah, there's per diem. And tax free. Yeah. yeah. And these guys, like, you know, for years got away with doing those kinds of missions. But then 9-11 happened and then... I would have to say, probably for both, for like, and I'll let Zach speak for himself or PSYOP, but from my experiences, after post 9-11, really is where the book starts to get written on the capabilities of CA and PSYOP, and really how it morphed from like one fucking thing that was just in a book. Like, it was like some guy down at SWIC wrote a book on how civil affairs and PSYOP operates. And it's probably like an outdated FM where you just look at it and you go, that's not how real life works. And, uh, I think the best example of how you saw that fucking change and that book get thrown out the fucking window was Iraq. Because, especially Iraq, when I first got the, there. The intent, correct me if I'm wrong, behind civil affairs is, you know, civil engagement. That well, I mean, the, the view I've always had of it is that you guys go out and you build schoolhouses and wells and, and things like that to help the civilian population. Yeah, but for it's not just for that purpose. Like, so, like, if we were to go out into an area and do, like, a... Like a big thing back in 04, 05 was like a vet cap or a met cap. Yeah. Um, well, that was one big thing. Yeah. Uh, you're doing a service for your battle space owner maneuver. Mm -hmm. um, where you might do that in some shitty fucking area. So what, what exactly is a med cap? Or? So a med cap would be a, a situation where you bring in uh, doctors, mm -hmm. PAs, mm -hmm. um, even just medics. Mm -hmm in like a shitty area that where people wouldn't have um, any access, any real access to like many medical facilities or anything like that. Right. And ironically, where I remember doing med caps a lot in 2004 and 2005 was on the back side of the green zone outside. Like I was saying to Jack earlier, like a lot of people don't realize that in Baghdad there is like farmland and there's villages. Mm -hmm. And it's ironically right next to the green zone. So we did a bunch there where I always found it interesting that the people that lived literally 10 minutes outside the heart of what Baghdad is didn't have access to any kind of real medical stuff. So what they would do is go in there and you get like, you know, whatever maneuver element you have there that's the battle space owner, send in a company of infantry or armor or whatever and cordon off an area and then create like a choke point where local nationals would come in with whatever animals you see people coming in with cholera or fucking you know women that just gave babies like had babies in the dirt had no way to like give them nourishment or anything like that and individually treat them one by one it's like a band-aid on a bullet wound you yeah. know what I mean? but if it works then that local group of people that might before you got there that want to they may not like you right. and like they might be more inclined to support whatever you know insurgent element that would be in the area especially in that, like an area like that that would be so close to a high value target right that might change their mind a little bit like right. their kid's dying right and then all of a sudden they come in and you give them a z-pack right it's, it's dying of something that you shouldn't be dying of but the local national doesn't know right and you give them something like the magic bullet or the magic pill, and then fucking not the magic bullet. That would not be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you give them like the magic pill, and all of a sudden the baby stops having a fever. You didn't mean the magic bullet. No, stop. No, no Stop tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, Zach, then I'd like to hear yeah. 
on the psyop end. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can introduce that topic a little bit of what psyop is. Is that hot? I'm hot. It's a little hot. If you want to turn on the AC, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, so like PSYOP, I think the best way that I've come up with to describe it is like if you picture like a conflict area, within the conflict itself, you, you have a need to try to influence people's behaviors. And that, that would be like tactical PSYOP. Mm -hmm. And then outside of that area, you want to kind of shape the narrative of it at the local, regional, and potentially international level. And that would be like strategic level PSYOP. And it's, it's another thing, I mean, like, Similar to CA, it can be a great force multiplier, but it's often not integrated early enough into the process. And then, like, you get there and it's like the op order is written, like, the annex is written, the side annex, and like, you're so limited what you can do that, like, you're often like playing catch up right when you get there. Because so the battle you, space has already been developed. Yeah. Yeah. So you mean like Big Army has already figured out like, hey, we're going to invade Iraq, and then you get tacked on after the fact, like yeah. brought in at the last yeah, yeah, minute. Yeah, yeah. Like, you, find a, you find quite a bit of and, that. And is that why you guys kind of like, I feel like, you know, on the outside looking in, we like often see you guys as like the guys who like drop leaflets. And, yeah. and I mean, yeah, you can do that, <laughs> but I mean. Yeah, so you get a lot of that. So um, Iraq, last time I was there, it was a lot, we had a lot more freedom to maneuver, and we could do a lot more. The way we did do a lot of leaflets, um, but when <laughs> we I was, know we'd see them on the news every so often. Yeah, but when I was in Afghanistan, um, like 2015, we were extremely limited what we could do, and so most of what we did was uh, like buy with and through, um, advise and assist locals. So like no one really knew what we were actually doing. Advise and assist you know. locals in psychological operation. Yeah. Okay. Um, so like, and by that I mean like mainly. What we would do is, so you have like the Ashgate and Anna Police, and you'd like, you're basically like, if it's, I, I work in marketing now, you're basically trying to like build and shape their brand and like advise mm -hmm. them on how to do that. Um, which realistically comes down to a lot of uh, stop making social media posts with dead bodies. That's like, really? Yeah. You guys should work for the SEALs. That's, yeah. No! Oh, <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. We're gonna get some down votes for that. Dave. I know. I'm yeah. gonna get some down votes yeah. for that. Oh wait, I'm gonna watch because that's when. It, uh... Well, that was like. I mean, that's. I saw that Afghanistan and um, Iraq. You see the same yeah. thing. No, you're right. You're right. Like South America, like that's just yeah, like that's right. common. Yeah. That's so common. I see yeah. the Peshmerga doing that all the time. Yeah, like, dragging yeah. bodies yeah. behind. Yeah, the yeah that's only really like half yeah. the meetings with them are like, yeah. you guys gotta stop. So like, yeah. 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 The same thing. I mean, even you know some of the guys I knew in Iraq. I mean. When ISIS came to town, it was like, what, 2015, yeah. 2014, 2015, uh, they just like machine gunned all the people they were holding mm -hmm. in their prison until offer and like took a picture of it and put it on social media and then, and then boogied out of town because ISIS was about to overrun them. It's like, oh, guys, yeah, yeah. Not, not a great look. Yeah, yeah. not yeah. a great look. Yeah. And it makes it difficult for all of us to come and work with those partner forces because yeah. it's like, you're committing mad war crimes, bro. Like, yeah. <laughs> there are a lot, like the Leahy Amendment prevents us from working with you if, you know, you're, you're engaging yeah, in that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Can you imagine if fucking, if like Ira the Iraqi army guys now or the Iraqi police had fucking social media back in 2004? Right. The shit you'd yeah. be fucking Mass saying? Mass graves. Like, right. fucking like, yeah. So, do either one of you know sort of the history of your organizations in terms of how did they fall under when they were when they were stood up when they were created were they were they immediately conceived as a special operations forces or did they eventually interestingly psyops predates special forces yeah and there, it was like first psychological operations yeah. command the, or something yeah, the like that and, yeah leaflet and loudspeaker company and, and, yeah. and, and oh, wow I, yeah. I, I, it's like I, World War II, yeah. And I think SF was actually like nestled underneath it initially, and then it later became SF. Yeah. And now if I remember my history correctly. Now it's going to eat it. Because SF yeah. was initially conceived out of the OSS, right. which was a and partisan then it, and then it came into the yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. CA was actually uh, specifically designed as a post-World War II thing to oh. rebuild like Germany and, really? yeah, and all that. And then do you know how it came to be like a uh, special op? Is it just I think it was just, just such a fucking weird thing. And it yeah. was like, it, it doctrinally, it, it kind of, the hearts and minds thing was, you know, that's obviously a cornerstone of the SF sure. thing. And like, yeah, sure. And maybe it was kind of like perceived to be the kind of like unit that could, which it ended up doing like complement them. That if like, uh, 
if you had to put the fucking, you know, the iron fist and you didn't want to have the velvet glove, you could use CA to be the velvet yeah. glove on top of the other. Well, it also seems like it, it in <clears throat> with special forces, like with their perceived role or their, their intended mm -hmm. role as, you know, a uh, FID or something like that, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I can see how civil affairs, particularly going in, you know, going into, you know, SF setting up an A team and saying, you know, like their engineer can only do so much, yeah. only knows how to do yeah. so much stuff, right? I mean, ideally, he's supposed to be able to build a well and, you know, do all this stuff. Yeah. But I can see how that would come in and, and, and be a force multiplier in, in that sense. Well, if you think about it, right, so like, it's a total weirdo unit, like, because it's a, and I don't mean that in a bad way, I mean it in like, in a way where it's a unit that's got like all these guys with different talents, right? Different backgrounds where you have like, you know, you, you're talking about on the way over here, you have vets in yeah. those units, like because that a vet cap is the same thing as a med cap, except it's for animals. Uh, veterans, yeah. yeah. Uh, not veterans, but like, veterans. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And so like you have to have this group of people that have all these fucking skill sets and then also have to be able to fucking operate and operate. Like so like it's not like you're just like so like let's say for instance you're gonna take somebody with a specialty outside the wire and you're going to provide security for that person, right? In that unit, you're just doing it on your own. You know what I mean? Especially if I go back to, like, in my first deployment, which was the weirdest fucking deployment and, and a very dangerous and fucked up deployment in 2004, 2005, there were times... To Iraq or Afghanistan? Iraq. I never yeah. did Afghanistan. Okay. Iraq, uh, 04, 05, and then I was in Iraq, 08, uh, 09. Mm -hmm. and, but in that time frame, in 04, 05, I was in Baghdad. And it was, you know, you were you were there then, right? It, uh, Not in Baghdad. I was in Mosul. I was, I was in Baghdad. Yeah. In I mean, so you five. remember how, like, it was yeah. just... So I remember... I, Mayhem. I was thinking about it a lot, like, talking to him or whatever. And I started to go back and started to remember a lot of stuff and look at paperwork. And I actually talked to my colonel today for a while, who was, like, I'm very close with. He was at my wedding. And we started talking about stuff, and I was like, oh, shit, that's right. We fucking did that. And, like... We when we showed up in Baghdad, there was teams there. Like the team that I replaced was living in a safe house. They had been there for the year before, and everything kicked. Like a safe house outside the green zone or, or inside. It the was green in zone? the green zone, but it was like their fucking safe house. Like it was like the, I knew guys lived in safe houses bef prior to that outside the wire by themselves. But then there was like a collective. Sure. Yeah. This is fucked up. Like, <laughs> yeah. Fucking, you know, yeah. But I remember fucking very vividly because I was like young and I was 24 and I was getting there and I was like, fuck, I'm going to Iraq. And I remember getting to fucking Baghdad and seeing these fucking guys. And like they had just been there when everything just went poof. And we got there in September. And so you had uh, Sadr City had kicked off in August, right? That was massive. Yeah. And then we got there and these guys had just like, it sounded like everything had just went like haywire in a minute. And they looked like fucking zombies. They were like shell shot. Yeah, because they were getting mortared every night. <laughs> that was probably the least of their problems. I think yeah. that towards the end, they, they didn't even really want to do it, a bright seat left seat. It, 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 was, it was just, I mean, it, it, was, it was a lot you know, yeah. at the time um, outside, yeah. Because I've never been to Baghdad in my life. Yeah. Like, so, I was all up north. So if you're familiar I mean, it was with crazy Baghdad, there. Yeah. If you're familiar with Baghdad, yeah. that area there was um, Kark, yeah. uh, Haifa Street, yeah. like Talia Square, Sheikh Maroof. Yeah. Like, yeah. And they like they didn't even want to do a fucking right seat, left seat. They were like, fuck this. Yeah. And so then like that's where... Well, especially if they were going out without like... Going uh, out in Haji with, Armor, Humvees, yeah. with six people in a turp. Yeah. And then we did that. For yeah. a long time, before they could say you couldn't do that anymore, like because we didn't have any. The weird thing was that maneuver, and we, could, you talk about how. Back in the day, there was never any mixing between these types of units and, you know, big army maneuver. Yeah. Like maybe your paths crossed in fucking Desert Storm, or, you know, these guys all sit down at a table together in Bosnia and had a fucking you know big meal and a bunch of vodka, but on a tactical level on the ground. They never crossed paths. So big army, and at that time it was first cav. They didn't know what the fuck. Like right. so, they were like, "You go do your stuff." Like I remember my colonel telling me that he had a general asking him to create a Manhattan project once. Like give me a Manhattan project breakdown of what CA does. 
And he's like, I don't even know what the fuck that means. I know. Yeah, that's yeah. what he wants. So they were like, when we got there, it was really, I would say probably it was a good like five, six months of just figure out, you know what you guys do. You have enough guys by our standard at the time to get outside the wire. You go do your shit. And maybe send us an email, a report, and we'll, we'll keep you connected with a targeting, a non-kinetic targeting officer from... You know, whatever, you know, I think at the time it was like 464 Third ID, and you let him know what you guys are doing. So, did, um, how did, like, is there one singular civil affairs school? I know that you would bring in people from all professions, but how did civil affairs, how did, how, how did they prepare you guys to be self sufficient when it came to? Security when it came to you know a combat operations. Well, I, I went to well you did we went to SWIC. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And what's SWIC for the this special warfare center? Yeah. Same place that the big gray building. Yeah. 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 And, they, and, and Green Berets go there and yeah. Okay. So you were you were trained in in. It's, it's a long course. There's you know they mix tactical with you know schoolhouse and right. it's all yeah. spliced up and then. Well, why don't we use that as a jumping off point then for each of you to talk about how you came into the army and why you chose the path that you went down. And get into that training pipeline. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I got in late. I didn't join until I was 28. Uh, Old man. Yeah. 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 Um, so I graduated college, got a real job, was bored, and you know, I came in as an 18 X-ray, which is the special forces program where they take people off the street and yeah. you go right into the uh, selection and the Q course. And I was in the Q course and I got hurt. And, uh, you know, they were kind of laying my options out before me. And I, I think PSYOP had me for people. And they were like, you can just jump into the PSYOP Q course. And I was like, the hell's a PSYOP? You know? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I don't know. So I said, yeah. Um, so, like, the, the PSYOP course kind of runs a, a little bit in parallel. Um, you go through language school together. And then you go through, like, a, a basic, like, Book, this is what PSYOP is. This is how you do it. You literally go over the FM basically, page by page. Then you go to language, then you do like a tactical portion, and then you do like a, one of the things, big things in PSYOP is the, the MIST teams. They go and they advise and assist at, at embassies, and you do like a mock embassy level part. And then, uh, yeah, there's a, a culmination exercise, and then you're. How long good. was the uh, actual PSYOP Q course? Um, so if you went in, if you went in to sign up from, if that was your intention in the beginning, it's about, it's a little over a year. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, but six months of language. Yeah. That's quite a course. Yeah. <clears throat> and what about civil affairs? How long? So, yeah. well, first I, off, your story, yeah. Yeah, no, no. So I, I came in at 23. Uh, I had gone to military college uh, early on, and then I, I went to Valley Forge Military College, and then I graduated. It's a two-year college. Actually, they have a, they're one of the few schools that has an early commissioning program. At the time I thought about it, but then I didn't want a commission, and then I went to finish my last two years at a school called Montclair State up in North Jersey. And I was doing ROTC at, uh, I decided maybe I'll go back and I'll think about it. And I was doing ROTC at uh, Seton Hall. And then 9-11 um, happened, and you know I was in North Jersey the day it happened. And it was always kind of like, I was always gonna join, and then, uh, but I wasn't sure which pa uh, path I wanted to go down, and you know I could see that the fucking the war drums were fucking beating, and I had a yeah they were fucking beating back in 2003. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, I had a mentor at Valley Forge, who was this like old school, really uh, I don't even know how to describe him. like you would like him. Like he was just like an old school SF. He wasn't like a paper tab SF guy. He was like a just a like, cool kind of squirrely like guy <laughs> and he was like Josh he goes I would tell you that if you want to go to the latest greatest unit that like that's going to be on the forefront you should go civil affairs so I was like all right and then ironically there was a uh, a unit in at Dick's uh, uh, F, it was, uh, the 404 civil affairs battalion which is an uh, it was a FID UW unit it was like the only one and uh so I went down there and I talked to those guys and they they had they were in the invasion like so a lot of the guys were not there, 
they actually went in. Who came into the North? Was it 10th group or 10th group? 10th yeah. group, yeah. So they came in with 10th group. They were there on the ground when 173rd jumped in and all that stuff. Really? And, uh, and I was like, you know, I talked to these guys and they're like, yeah, this is what we do. This is all this shit and whatever. And I was like, cool. And I knew a guy down at Bragg and I decided that I was going to go and I talked to a recruiter and I passed my ass fab and all this stuff and I went in. And I went in as a, it was a 38 Alpha at the time. Now it's a 38 problem. And so 2003, I was in, went to basic, then went to SWIC. And what, what exactly is a 38 Bravo? It's Civil Affairs. They okay. changed so it to 38 Alpha, now it's Officer 38 Alpha. Okay. And I went in as Civil Affairs and thinking I was going to be like this like cool reserve guy or whatever. And then immediately like got, I, I went through SWIC. SWIC then was long. Uh, and then I graduated and then stayed on active duty for a little bit down there and then came home, didn't know what my status was. Then all of a sudden, at the time, the orders came to USASOC, but they put me with a unit up in, uh, I think it was the 443rd, which is a unit at Rhode Island, and then got sent all fucking, I guess what is the word, is TACOM, whatever, back down to Bragg, and then we were there for a while, and then we like, I was like, yeah, I'm going to stay at Bragg and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, they're like, no, you're going to Iraq. And you're going to Iraq with, like, all these fucking dudes. <laughs> and then it turned out, I was, and I was so pumped. Like, that was the thing. Like, you remember, like, back Hell in the yeah. day. And, uh, and I was going with, like, two guys that I graduated SWIC with. And we ended up staying together the whole entire deployment with, like, my best friends. And, um, and then we ended up in Iraq. And then we got there in uh, September of four, and we were just totally inundated with how bad it was. And that was the deployment you were talking about when you got there and the yeah. guys were like all like glazed over a thousand oh, yards fucking scared. zombies, man. Like, I mean, it was like, it was like, I'd never seen some, my wife, I could be away for fucking three weeks, my wife would never be that happy to see me when I walked <laughs> in. These guys were like, I couldn't even describe what the fucking, like, they, I'm pretty sure a lot of these guys want to hug me and kiss me. It was like that scene in Band of Brothers when you get to the fucking concentration camps and these guys are all going up and hugging them and kissing them. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here, bro? I'm like, I just got relaxed. Like, fuck. And, uh, yeah. And then that was, yeah, that was it. And then, I mean, I'll get into stories later about, like, the, the progression of my experience with CA in that deployment. And probably the only reason why we were successful enough and only lost one guy was because of leadership. Had some pretty fucking awesome leadership. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, that fucking deployment, like, that was like, I, they were, to put it in perspective, when I got back to Bragg, after that deployment, they were looking to grab guys from, I guess the guys are from SWIC, looking to write, start putting down pen and paper, lessons learned, because they realized, like, that was like, because you had CA teams from, you remember, that was like, 04, so you had CA teams in Baghdad, you had CA teams in Al Anbar, Fallujah, like fucking... Mosul in the north, fucking, like, there was, like, shit popping off everywhere. Now, was CA, uh, were they very active in Afghanistan also? Yeah, and there's actually, I don't know if I ever say this, there's a really good, and I know the guy, uh, Colonel Gardner, who, uh, was in it, there's a really good 60 Minutes story about it. Okay. And it was really early on, I think it was, like, February 2002 that they did a thing about him, and... It's it's good, but it also shows that like whatever they did was so localized that like it had no like major impact. Like it could be like in a small fucking place, and you can go two miles away, and nobody knows what the fuck is going on. Yeah, I, I was uh, like uh, in in sort of a different capacity uh, went with a couple like med caps and things like that in Afghanistan, and also. You know, there were also just the local, the going out uh, and passing out like cricket bats and, and um, cooking oil yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And in Afghanistan, you ran into the issue of the uh, tribal elder always coming in and beating everybody back and taking everything for himself and then like deciding, you know, how he Who was going to parse it out. Yeah. yeah. But med caps are good because, you know, you bring in female doctors, especially in a place like Afghanistan where it's so segregated. Iraq's not so much like that, you know, because it's a lot, it, it yeah. tends to be more advanced in terms of, uh, you know, being secular. But um, in Afghanistan, you bring in the female doctors and, you know, uh, female interpreters and, you know, and it, there's a lot of good intelligence, you know, work that can be done uh, in that capacity because 
women never get a chance to really talk to anybody. Yeah. You know, so. What was that unit that they had that they stood up, down, uh, the female unit? CSTs? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, CSTs and they've been known as a couple. Of this. That program got shut down. Yeah, those are gone now. And there's a couple other. And then there's the FET teams, the female yep, engagement yep, teams. Yep, yep. We had those. Oh, see that smile. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Oh, is there some stories about FET teams? No, no. <laughs> the, the, the FET, the FET was. Uh, were they Marines or were there Army also? Uh, there was Army for a little bit, and then I knew some people that tried out, and I. I don't know what happened to him. Yeah, I mean, I know, I know a few. I've known a few CSTs over the years, like super good. Um, but at the same time, yeah, there, there's the the the, the subcontext. I mean, CSTs and, and the FETs. I mean, a lot of times they ended up getting used as a harem for ODAs. And, yeah. I mean, that, that's <laughs> it's not politically correct. You're not supposed to say that on a, on YouTube, I yeah. guess. But I mean, uh, that that is how it ends. We're not on it. I mean, we, we don't make any money anyway. So <laughs> yeah, I know. So it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if this video gets demonetized. Joke, jokes on you, fuck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time, you know, I, I completely acknowledge there's a role for women to pr uh, provide yeah. these female soldiers to provide these types of capabilities. I, I mean, I even think that there's a role for women to be on an ODA doing those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, maybe that whole, our whole approach to it kind of needs to be overhauled and rethought. It, it, it's challenging because I remember uh, we went out and did an operation where we, where we needed a, um, we needed a, a female on an operation. Um, and so we went to the army, to their, to the MPs and said, Hey, you know, like give us your most fit, you know, person, you know, your yeah. most fit female. Um, and we, you know, we went into a village and hit a target in a village, and then the person we were looking for wasn't there, so we had a follow-on that was like three miles, four miles away, you know, and wearing all the kit and everything. It was freezing cold outside. <clears throat> so, uh, was it four? Yeah, it was probably about four, uh, four miles away. So we started, we started moving out, and by the time uh, we got to the next objective, her her nods had fallen off. They were dragging it on a dummy cord. You know, she was like surrounded. She we, she'd fallen back. We had a security on that. And this isn't like banging on her. She wasn't trained for this. You right, know? right. Yeah. Um, I mean, it got. We had to commandeer a car. You know, at, at the next objective to get to get back to the HLZ. You know, in order to, mm -hmm. to you know, so we get there in a timely manner. So it, it there's definitely a place for selected women who are mission capable. It's yeah, just right. it's, it's difficult to determine how, you know. Do you do you make an all female unit and pull from them? Do you do you seed them with yeah. male units where where there's only sometimes a, a limited a limited use for them? You know, uh, not a limited use, but you know. Be, uh, well, being the troglodyte that I am, I actually think yeah, it should be all female units. Yeah, like a whole like have like a platoon of them. Yeah, I do too. You know? I yeah. do too. And just, just eliminate a lot of the bullshit. One hundred percent goes along, but I don't think I don't think you can even do that legally because you know hasn't there been like Supreme Court rulings? I don't that, know, man. I mean, not only up until recently you had all male units. Like you had. I know. Yeah. Look at what happened. Yeah. yeah. Then they crashed the party. <laughs> well, the CST was an all female unit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, it does like I see so what you're saying, like. I don't. I've never been in Afghanistan, I, but even in Iraq, there's certain times when you're dealing with local nationals that like you have to have a female. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, it's it's yeah. really people just won't fucking talk to men. Right. Well, and that's the other thing is like when you're on target, and if you're separating people on target so they can't hear each other's story, it it gets it get you know it gets very um, it gets very risky in terms of. Uh, just PR if you take a woman alone in a room to question, yeah, just, just yeah. to ask her who, you know, who's here, who are the people who own this house, who are the people who live in this house, you know, things like that, you know, um, yeah. cause then if the men start, you know, it, it just gets really risky. So yeah, I mean, there's always like that, that need in those environments, you know, well, probably in any environment. I mean, we, we talk about Iraq and Afghanistan cause that's our experience, but even, even if that were to happen in, in a more police officer here in New York City. 100%. Yeah, yeah 100%. Even as a bartender, like, fucking sometimes I run into situations where there might be a fucking woman in the bar causing a scene, and, like, I don't want to fucking throw her out, like, like put my hands you on her. You can't manhandle her, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, and I'm, like, looking around the bar to see if, like, 
as a combat multiplier looking around the bar to see if there's a fucking female that I can grab to say, get yeah. this fucking bitch out of here because yeah. this is fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah. But, like, I've heard stories in South America news. where people are like, yeah, you know, there'll be an ODA with a CA guy, yeah, a yeah. guy, and they'll run into like women and they that are aggressive and like Let's nobody see. knows what to do. Right. I yeah. saw it. Everyone and just shuts down and yeah. it's just yeah. like Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I've seen that on Target too. Yeah. Oh yeah, in in Iraq, taking this uh, Iraqi SWAT team on Target, and uh, these guys would just like freak out around like like these yeah. women would oh, come yeah. up to them on the objective and like grab oh, them, yeah. grabbing their gun. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. it's like wailing and everything. Yeah. And these Iraqi guys, supposedly a bunch of badasses we train, just freak us up. They're like, <laughs> yeah, oh, no, no. Oh. they will. The Iraqi guys. I mean, most guys from any culture, well, from our culture or the Iraq or Afghan, will shut down. But, but uh, I would have no but, problem putting a palm in the face at that point and like, you over there, yeah. stop that. <laughs> yeah, it, it gets it gets difficult because the, I've seen that on Target too with both Iraqis and Afghanis where if a woman comes out and grabs them, and it's particularly it it's particularly tough in Afghanistan, you know, if if they're wearing like a full burqa. So you, you don't know who's under there. You don't know who's under oh, yeah. there. You don't know yeah. what they've got. You don't know if they're rigged. Yeah. You know, yeah. But, but, yeah. but your guys will not, they will not, Take aggressive action right. to keep them at bay. Right, right. Well, yeah. even with fucking, even with Iraqi women, like then you have the, there was multiple cases where you had Iraqi women blowing themselves up yeah. there, where oh, they're yeah. fucking like, yeah. Yeah. Was, uh, not the, not the stuff that the, the burkas, but the the big black fucking yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's bad news, man. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Maybe things will change, and you know, twenty years from now, ten years from now, we'll have these like you know, ranger. Seal chicks, you know, seal women who are like highly trained. I mean, I'm not trying to be a smart ass about it, but I mean, it's just right now we've had a difficult time trying to figure out how to integrate women into these these formations. Um, yeah. And you know, maybe we'll just be in a different world in, in ten years. Yeah. Um, well, that you'll have. Of Caitlyn Jenner. So, like, I still don't think like the so they they've changed the PT test now. The leg tuck they, is causing some consternation. They, they, yes, yeah. they, they, but I think they're at least moving in the right direction in that it's like the sit like there's, there's one not a standard. female scale yeah. and a male scale. There's one scale. Right. Because I like I have worked with some women, like a uh, used to with this girl Cat, uh, smaller girl, but she deadlifted like 270 pounds. I've probably worked with like guys that aren't that strong. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like so, yeah. like I think there's definitely women out there that are capable, and we just don't give them the opportunity. Right. So like, I don't know. I got. I don't know how to like yeah, integrate like, better. If, if you open up the doors, maybe they'll come. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and it's tough. Yeah, hopefully. And it's tough because you know you you may have a female who's operational capable, but you know they're it. You know, have them <clears throat> move <clears throat> several. You know, fifteen clicks under a full combat load under yeah. sixty pound yeah. sixty pound ruck. It, it, it might be a bridge too far, but that doesn't make them any less. Yeah, I'm capable on target. I had a uh, you know. Mark Boyat told me, he was uh, the commander of third group, and he was like, we have got to figure out how to get women on ODAs somehow. And like, maybe they're not Green Berets, maybe they don't go through the entire Q course, maybe they can't do everything you can do carrying a rucksack and, and shooting and, and all these sorts of things you expect a male Green Beret to do, but there are all these other things they can do that we can't. Right. Um, so we just got to figure out how to make it work. And unfortunately, there's like all this politics and, and yeah. gender yeah. policing, all this other bullshit. Yeah. Right, right. The, the, like, yeah. You can't you can't get an honest assessment because yeah. of, because politics yeah. are involved yeah. too much. Yeah. You know, and it's one of those things that like if you have an exceptionally qualified fit female who you know does make it through a Q course, it does make it through Ranger School, it does yeah. it does you know make it through budget. One of these things. Then, then there are there are certain people who go. Oh well, you have one woman, so you need more. So make sure yeah. make sure there are more, yeah. as opposed to just going. Okay, like th yeah. this this you know these are the women that, that made it. The politicians just make it like so much more difficult. It's like man, just like tear the band aid off, right. and like if they pass the standard, they pass. Like it'll happen, right? You yeah. know they'll right. come right. eventually, right? Like stop trying to like fo force a square peg into a round hole. Right. Try <laughs> stop trying to make it happen. Right. You know. Yeah. 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 And what's crazy is uh, I, I think that most of the the most vocal people about the injustice of the whole system have never even served in them. Like they're not even oh, yeah. willing to do yeah. it. Or, yeah. or or they were, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the pogest of the pogues 
who were like somewhere <laughs> way, way. They were they were working at like the super jock what? on bag. Wait, what did that mean? What the fuck did that mean? <laughs> I don't want you to take offense at you know. Can you define poke for us? Please? Yeah, and, and <laughs> the fact that you think Josh should take offense is kind of offensive. <laughs> I wasn't to point it out specifically to Josh. I just don't want anyone to misinterpret my words. Pogue is a person other than Grunt. Yeah. Uh, so anyone who is not, uh, uh, anyone who has a, a GT score above 110 would be yeah, Pogue. Right, right, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, hey, Alex, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, Alex uh, gave us on a super chat. And um, yeah, uh, Alex uh, actually started a subreddit for us. Yeah. It's a uh, Reddit backslash horror backslash the team house. Is, or, it, is it team house or the team house? I, I don't know where on subreddit. I, I, I have been to the subreddit though. That's why I upload everything. I upload everything. <laughs> um, so, Zach, on your end, uh, yeah. de deviating away from all the, the gender politics, yep, yep. Um, you were active duty PSYOP because mm -hmm. you came from the X ray program. Yep. Uh, what unit did you get assigned to? What was your first deployment with PSYOP? So, I went to 5th Battalion. Uh, Cyclops, uh, PSYOP, obviously, um, and that's what's called a regional battalion, mm -hmm. um, focused on the PACOM region, so Asia, and, like, that battalion is supposed to do, like, missed rotations, so, supposed to go to embassies and, like, support, like, regional and strategic objectives, so I went there, and that, that wasn't really what I wanted, um, so there was an opportunity, nobody wanted to go to Afghanistan, so I volunteered for that, and, like, that was my first deployment, um, came back from that. Where and, were you in Afghanistan? Kabul. Okay. Yeah. Right. Bounced out a little bit, but Kabul. Okay. Really. Yeah. Um, I came back from that and I got invited to try out for a USOC unit. And, like, I don't know, like, it kind of went my way. Like, I, I did all right. And then I got orders to, uh, like, JSOC. And then I stayed in JSOC the rest of my time. Basically. To the command or to a unit assigned to the command? I was at the command for a little bit, and then uh, I, I briefed some stuff, and then a unit just grabbed me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about like what the PSYOP mission is? Because uh, like so many of, uh, I mean, a lot of people in the general public have no clue whatsoever. But even us, like special yeah. forces yeah, yeah, guys, yeah. we think, like you guys are like weird mind fuckers. Uh, what do you guys bring to the table? So that's, like, like, we we don't even know what your capabilities are, and we're the people who should. Um, I, I just feel like there's a lot of misconceptions and no, misunderstandings. It's crazy. Like, um, it's it's a totally misunderstood branch. No one really knows how to utilize you. Um, yeah. So, like I said, like I mean, at the tactical level, you're really looking at trying to like influence people to do something, and like sometimes that's like embarrassingly obvious. Like we work some stuff in Iraq. Like or, the leaflet drops are the obvious. Or it's like you put all the leaflet drops to like civilians in one area to tell them to do something when really you're going to invade from somewhere else. Right, and deception. Somehow, and somehow that works every time. Like, it's really, like, it, like the most embarrassing stuff is, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, like, people think you're, like, really clever, and you, you're talking about it later, you're like, no, we're really not. It's, it's very obvious what we do. Um, but yeah, so, like, you do stuff like that. You just try to get people to do one thing so that you can take advantage of it. You, you look at patterns, and you look for things that you can take advantage of. And I think, like, a lot of people are dismissive of PSYOPs, but it's like, if you're thinking in the context of a war, if you guys, through your through the psychological mm -hmm. operations, get five percent of the enemy army to desert, to yeah. throw down their guns and surrender, that's huge. Oh yeah, that's yeah, huge yeah. on the battlefield. Yeah. yeah, or I mean, like where the, I mean, like Afghanistan, like red on red was, was a big psyop push. So like Taliban versus Taliban. Mm -hmm. So like giving up a little bit of information to talk about, you know, like. Basically, you just want to accuse them of giving each other up constantly. Mm -hmm. and Snitching. Like, yeah, yeah. Because they hate that They're because it does Snitches happen. Get stitches. They're terrified <laughs> of it. And we made huge gains in that. Um, because then they start smoking each other. Yeah. 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 Which in a place stuff. like Afghanistan, yeah. because it's so regionally and tribally um, concentrated, it's probably a little bit easier to do just because they're, they're, they're already pre existing rivalries. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, but that was thing. So, like, that was a, a push in Afghanistan, and then um, commanders were like, "But like, we can't attribute that to you. Like, that just happened all the time, anyways. You know." And so, like, <laughs> you know, they're, they're always looking at like, "What's your your KPI? What's your key performance indicator?" 
And like for <laughs> for a little bit, we were working with I was working with a local, and we were, he was telling us like old like old school Peshmerga like insults, and we would like sprinkle those in that are like out of favor, and then like our KPI would be like if that came back into favor or if they use it again in some way or shape or form. So I used to have to report like these, there was this much red on red violence and then people started using this word again. <laughs> and that would be like my report. To, oh, right, you know. right. Yeah. yeah. In, in an ideal world, uh, uh, like uh, if, if for instance, before, in a, uh, before an operation started or before you know, the, the battle space was sort of solidified. In an ideal world, like, what, what are some of the operations that you would have liked to have seen done, or...? So it really comes down, it really comes down to, like, a, like, an intel, like, breakdown of the area, and of the people and the key players in it. And then you need someone that can, like, take that from, like, the side perspective, and then, like, tune, like, help shape the op order to give you, like, good left and right limits. And that's like that's something that's we're still working on. But I mean, I think your point earlier was that psyop needs to be brought into the the planning process yeah. way earlier. Well, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, there's other things too. Like uh, like the speed of information now is so fast. Um, like, is this live or is this? Yeah, this is live. Yeah, this is live. live. Can't do that, psyop world. Right, because it has to go through approval. Yeah, and like our approval process. If you're at the strategic level, it can take weeks. Right. So like something can happen, or like. Uh, your enemy can put out propaganda, and it can take you three weeks to respond. Well, I mean, never, and like you're you're gone by that. Yeah, point. and I mean, like, never, not never a, mind the twenty four hour news cycle. I mean, right. what's the lifespan of a meme or, a, right. or, a, or right. the, the that the daily outrage? Yeah, that exactly. Right. In, yeah. 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 What like, what uh what is? I mean, uh, can you talk about like? Uh, does your final approval at a strategic level rest at the DNI or is it at an army level? It or? depends on what you're doing, what, where you're at. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, we were talking about or earlier. You said some of that stuff actually needed congressional approval, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, social media, internet is, is huge. That's how most people get most of their information mm -hmm. nowadays. Um, and there's a lot of hesitancy of the U.S. government to let PSYOP use that, and that's it's justified. Um, the big fear is that like somehow will influence the U.S. population, right? Which is like super illegal. Yeah, like right. if you were to do yeah. it intentionally, but there's still the fear it could happen unintentionally yeah. with anything that goes yeah. on the internet. So like, yeah. like I get it. That's like perfectly understandable, but you're working against. And that's the Schmidt Mund Act, I think, oh. that governs that. Oh, I don't know. I just know I just get shut down a lot of my comments. <laughs> but, I, think, uh, I think it was Schmidt Mund that was shutting you but down. But you, like you look at stuff and like. Russia has the ability to put out something like a hundred million unique pieces of information a day using bots. Zero fucks given. Yeah, th there's like zero approval process. No laws, no nothing. And then like we no can, Congress. And then like we'll f we'll fight it, and uh, like we have like some Facebook page and some other stuff, but they all they're all U.S. government attributable. Like they all right, say right. like. Centcom somewhere out, you know what I mean? It's like the the, the Operation Inherent Resolve website, you know, yeah. things like that. So like, we I spent a lot of time like mapping how like other governments or how other entities can spread misinformation, <laughs> and just like how many tweets and how many pieces of information they can put out, and then like you look at our approval process and what we can put out, and it all says U.S. government, and it's like six things against like thirty million. And then, you know, like, people come down and you're like, why are you guys losing? You're like, oh. Yeah, why do you think? Yeah, like, yeah. I, mean, so I can map smart. it. I can literally map it out for you. I just yeah. can't do anything about it. But, like, I get it, too. Like, I, <laughs> I get the hesitancy to, like, let any government organization just go wild. Sure. On the internet. You know? And uh, I have a, an acquaintance of mine who did stuff like this for the CIA back in the, ooh, in the 80s. Yeah. Uh, targeting Libya, actually. And it was, like, on VHS tape. And they were like distributing like VHS tape yeah. like rap videos and stuff like that. Yeah. And you know, it'd be it would be interesting to get you two guys together in a room sometime to talk about this subject. Um, yeah, really interesting cat. Yeah. So those are some of the uh, the limitations on psyops. I mean, I, actually, the the one um, psyop story that was is not nothing I experienced myself. Well, okay, part of it I did, which I thought was really interesting and that a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, I went and saw a film premiere in Erbil one time. 
uh, because I knew the director, yeah. uh, who's a Kurdish guy, Kurdish film director, and he produced this film, a very, very pro-Barzani film. Barzani is the head of the KDP. Uh, KDP is a Kurdish political party uh, that encompasses or build the hook and that, that general area for people who don't know. Um, very, very pro-Barzani and about Barzani's fight against ISIS. And, you know, Barzani is the hero. Boom, boom, F-16 strike, F-16 strike, all this stuff. Um, it was presented by the, what is it, the American Kurdish Friendship Association? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is that? Like, I've never heard that of that. That sounds amazing. A a ACAB or something like that? American Kurdish. Uh, anyways. Um, and then I went down to uh, Fort Bragg one time, and I was talking to the PSYOP unit down there. And they, one of the guys mentioned to me, one of his, his most, uh, he felt his most important experience was he was in Indonesia and they funded a anti-extremist film, mm -hmm. um, anti jama Islamia. Um, and it was produced and created by Indonesians and mm -hmm. filmed and premiered in, in Indonesia. And it had zero fingerprints on it from America mm -hmm. at all. Um, and he was like, yeah, I was really proud of that because there were like family members of, of people who had joined J.I. And they were like in the audience crying and stuff like this. And he, he was like, it was just so important and meaningful to him. And as I was walking down the hall with a couple of the PSYOPs guys, I mentioned this Kurdish film I had seen like the year prior. I'd been at the premiere and I was like, you know, I always had this, uh, you know, this feeling about this film. And he was like, oh, yeah, that was one of ours. <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah. But I mean, that that's... That's how it's supposed to be, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you're not skirting the rules, but you get a lot more leeway well, with by with and through. So that's always like that's yeah, yeah. always the better way to. No, I, I wasn't yeah. implying that it was no, skirting yeah, yeah, the rules. Yeah. I mean, I think it's completely lawful. Yeah. Um, what they were yeah. doing. Yeah. Yeah. Advise and assist is great. It's, <laughs> that's the best part of the mission, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I, I do think PSYOP has a lot they can bring to the table, you know. But as you said, they they need to be utilized correctly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, I think both units, like, they, yeah. from the beginning, not really well utilized at all. Well, before we get into, like, some, uh, I want to get into some particulars with both of you guys, yeah. um, some war stories, but uh, maybe address, uh, well, this isn't the elephant in the room for us, I mean, I've known you for, like, six years, but... I think more than that. There's, there's like, some major, like, anger and animosity between SF and y'all. Like, what the fuck is that about? <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, I honestly don't know I worked I didn't really work with PSYOP guys overseas mm -hmm. I did work with a, uh, a what do you call tactical CA teams yeah cat, uh, cat, cat teams cat teams, cat teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cat yeah 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 right. I worked with yeah. I worked with uh, a tactical CA team in Iraq I had a good experience with them I like those guys yeah like what is the big like What's drama. The What's the beef? What's the beef? Like, what's dish? What's dish? Why is SF always throwing shade at you? You're hearing guys? it what's... here first. <laughs> what's that about? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I, these guys, I remember back when I'd see, like, we had a PSYOP team that was with us. When they would operate, they were pretty useful, like, for things like med caps and bed caps and stuff like that. But they couldn't stop this this one team. I don't know if it was their slogan or it was like the broad slogan of the fucking of all psyop was uh, we kill you and make you love us for it. And they couldn't keep stop telling people that that was their fucking slogan. And I was like, you're not doing any fucking favors. <laughs> see that's see Jack. See I always thought the beef. See Jack said the beef is between SF and uh, like <clears throat> psyop so, so affairs. I always thought the beef was between civil affairs and psyop. So that's, that's always been a thing, I think. Like, I think there's a little competition there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's. Yeah, it's but like, I mean, you said it right at the beginning. Like we are kind of like the redheaded stepchildren. Yeah. Soft. Yeah, yeah. 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 And and so two redheaded step stepchildren are fighting for supremacy. I actually almost kind of want to say it's like the redheaded stepchildren of the army. Yeah. It's like the one yeah, fucking yeah. unit. Like these these units that like nobody understands. Like now now it's different. Like back in the day, like yeah, like what what do you do? Yeah, I just like, feel I just feel like SF guys are always looking at you sideways, like who the fuck are you? Who are you? Yeah, yeah. What, uh, what yeah. the what the fuck are you doing here, Josh? Yeah, I I, <laughs> yeah. I remember like so we spent a lot of time between like where I was and there was a base in, in Baghdad called Headhunter, Mathana Air Base, right? Uh -huh. Mathana Air Base, right in Sheikh Maroof, right inside of like Haifa Street. It was small. Uh, there was like a couple ODAs there. There were SEAL snipers there. 
but there was like probably one of the true stop joking Dave. tested <laughs> fucking units your, the most battle tested fucking units i will say this to the, for the rest of my life there was a fucking company and i always thought the first cab was really fucked up for doing this they didn't want to use their own fucking guys out there so they had a, like a bunch of different units attached to them they had a couple companies from the arkansas national guard the Arkansas fucking National Guard. Those guys <laughs> hooked and jabbed. Dude, fucking... I, I'm not kidding. I think Those guys <laughs> fucked it up. I think there's only a few fucking units, like I say, like, at least in my fucking experience, this Arkansas National Guard unit saw more fucking combat than, like, any unit in Iraq. Like, it was just crazy. And they were going out every fucking day onto Haifa Street and, like, just getting ripped apart and they come back and do it again the next yep. day. And it was just because first cap didn't want to put their own guys out there. So they're just using these like National Guard guys as proxies. The, like, the un- I I bet, let me tell you something about those. Guys. I, we uh, there was were, were you was was your house? No. So we ended up we took over that safe house for about a couple of days, and then we ended up going on to one of those smaller bases inside there, and then we split our time back and forth going back out. To, w- was your house like one of like nine? Uh, our house was a. What do you mean, like a? Like were, were there were there like nine houses where you were at? No. Okay, I didn't know if it, you were in like a kind of a separate area or whatever. I know exactly what you're okay. talking about, though. So, <clears throat> so there was there was an Arkansas uh, an element of the Arkansas National Guard, the their armor, it, like what are, what was it, a mount, a mounted or armor or whatever? Yeah, they have Bradleys. Yeah, Bradleys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who who were there uh, to support uh, some of the you know, some of the other units and whatnot. And, um, and they would help us with our vehicles because we didn't have any mechanics. And um, one of their guys came, like one of their guys that was really, I was friendly with and everything, came over one time. And he's just like covered in like, <laughs> like soot and everything like that. And, uh, and he's like, uh, and we had conics full of like stuff, you know. And he's like, hey, Dave, do you, do you have an extra ACOG? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I can get you an ACOG, you know? So I go and I open up a Connex and get him an ACOG. Hey, what, what, did, you, did you lose yours? What? He goes, no, nah, I got shot off. I'm like, yeah, dude, take two. You know? <laughs> take two. I'm like, those guys were in the mix all the time. I'll tell you what, there is some group of guys somewhere down, like Little Rock or wherever, that are fucking like blood brothers. That got more kills that, than cancer. Oh <laughs> like, my god, are, man! Maybe when the history books are written, they'll go like, "Look at this fucking unit." But these guys Whoa. were like tough as a fucking coffin. One hundred percent. It was unreal. Like fucking and, like. The, the, and they they would go, they, they would like they would go empty on operation. Like they you know, and then they would like go back to base, refit, go back and roll back out. It's like Jesus. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Like they can't like they can't get enough, man. Was this was this the unit, uh the Death Blossom unit? Mm. There's some National Guard unit. No. Everyone was talking about the Death Blossom. Well there was at the same time, do you remember uh the Louisiana National Guard? They got a lot of trouble. Like fucking like cause they were doing all kinds of morbid shit. Oh like, they? they like fucking strapped the dead I didn't, I, to the fucking hood of a Humvee. Oh, <laughs> really? underneath an underpass on a fucking MSR. Just like fucking saying like this is who we are. Jesus like, Christ. Like, uh, yeah, I I mean I think Cajuns, it, man, what can you say? Cajuns. Like fucking like uh, it, it it I remember going out with these fucking guys. Like so we like I remember the operation specifically, it's called Operation Naji Sunrise, and they were going to go out to Hyper Street, to Talia Square, and they had this fucking, yeah. they had this fucking dude Thanks, that was like, he was picked up on a battlefield, and he had some information about somebody that they wanted. Somehow, he got rolled into this whole, this is what I get to, like, the whole weird CA aspect of it all, where they're just writing a book. They're going to go into this horrible neighborhood, right outside of fucking Talia Square, and they have this fucking guy hooded with like eye slits handcuffed to another uh, to an interpreter we roll out at fucking four o'clock in the, five o'clock in the morning in fucking Bradley's never been in a Bradley before in my entire life it was fucking hard <laughs> like, almost yes. zero yes. fucking description of what we're gonna go do now you have two cat teams my team and another team and we're in the back of these vehicles, and it's going, brrr, and like fucking, you can barely see out the windows. It's dirty as fuck. Yeah. Uh, and I know where we're, I know yeah. where we're going. Giant vehicle like, yeah. Fucking, yeah. Room. yeah. I'm yeah, sitting yeah. there, and I'm going, like, I, I know exactly where the fuck we're going, and this is not good. And it's like five o'clock in the morning. These things are fucking loud. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I hear 
not so far in the distance, like fucking was twenty five Mike Mike on top of that, like doo 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 doo, and I'm like, what the fuck? The ramps go down. You know what we were there to do? We were there to do a fucking sewage assessment. As these guys are gonna do a fucking raid. So we fucking come out in this fucking vehicle and the fucking ramp comes down and I so where we go? And they go over here and we're running and everybody's fucking running and I'm standing there in the alley and I'm watching this interpreter come running down the street with this guy fucking attached to his fucking arm and the, the guy just points at the door and on every swinging dick kicks the fucking door down. Some commander starts yelling about combat mitigation, which is a fucking CA thing apparently. So now these guys are all following him into the fucking room and then they pull a guy out and then this, this colonel over it he goes, take your fucking pictures, we're getting the fuck out of here. So they're sitting there running. From like the sewers? Yeah. There's something so Catholic-esque about this story. And it's like, afterwards I come back and I'm like, what the fuck was that? And even if we, and, and I looked at the blurry pictures of this fucking green shit because you know what the sewage looks like in Baghdad going, even if we can formulate a plan to fucking put somebody in there to fix it nobody's going back in there to fucking fix it it's a fucking like, Door it's like the lion's <laughs> dead like fucking like and it was just a terrible waste of fucking time and then I remember sitting there and these guys were like oh we got some good combat mitigation I'm like the fuck does that mean? Like, yeah. I went to the refrigerator, threw it on the ground, are you gonna go back there and buy a new fucking refrigerator? Like, fuck off! Like, and that's where it was like, the, the world's colliding, where they're like, we don't know what you do, but if you tell us you do this, then come with us and do this. Yeah. And it's like, that's bad. And then, the weirdest thing, was as they write the book, you're letting the new write the book, and you're going, we got a good mission for you. <laughs> and like, I mean, at, at the end of the day, I was You just, know they're trying to sell you something at that point. So, if you remember in the Green Zone, you had, would you have 15 different checkpoints around the circumference of the Green Zone? Yeah. So I mean, you could get there yeah. from, if you were a headhunter, you can get there. If yeah. you're in the Green Zone, you can get yeah. there or whatever. And then like clockwork in 2004 in fall, almost every fucking day, uh, VBID would go off. Yeah. Like Assassin's Gate yeah. or North Gate or yeah. whatever. And like you could you could fucking put it on in like a calendar and you'd sit there, you'd be drinking your coffee, having a cigarette, you're going, wait for it, wait for it, and then boom. Yeah. And so maneuver goes, CA would be really good at uh, QRF for MassCal. So fucking like because so uh, quick reaction for so they're saying that civil affairs would be great as a quick rea a reaction force to a mass casualty event. Yeah, which was like a daily thing. Yeah. So like you show up and everybody's spaghetti and fucking like everybody's losing their fucking minds running around, and then my team leader had an Arachna cell phone. Remember Arachna, which was like the old school fucking that was an Egyptian company yeah. that they put in there after the invasion for some fucking reason was the only guy that had an Arachna cell phone with like the local IP commander with like the local fucking first responder fucking like ambulances so you'd get there and then everybody's going nuts everything was disgusting there was just people like fucking bleeding out and whatever call the fucking IPs and get them to come over there so like you'd have to call them every day and that this is our fucking mission we're sitting there just in pandemonium waiting for the IP guy to get there and bring his crew with their pickup trucks then maybe a couple ambulances. And you're just hanging out outside the wire. Well, I mean, yeah, outside the wire all the time, but fucking, like, wait for the ambulances to get there, wait for fucking KBR's fucking... Do you ever see KBR's fire trucks? Back in the day, KBR did the fire like right. fire response for over there. The 50 cal on the top of the fire trucks, and then... That I never saw. Then they would show up, then they put everything out, and then fucking the Iraqis would sit there with their shovels, and they throw everything into the back of the fucking truck, like all the dead people, and then whatever one or two people that lived would go in the back of the fucking ambulance, go down to Hospital City, and that would be like an everyday thing for like a long time. And that was like our mission. <laughs> because the Iraqi police were incapable of just showing up on their own. Right. And the commander who knew nothing about CA was like, you guys, you interface yeah. with fucking local military, and yeah, yeah. this is a job for you. <laughs> yeah. so yeah. like, I remember like one is just sitting here and just hear boom, and I'm like, I don't want to see this again. And we just show up, and I'm like, Groundhog Day, and yeah. fucking, like, and that's it. Like, that was Jesus Christ. Yeah, that was the total. That was like where the heart of the misuse of CA was, because you couldn't figure out a mission. Like, we go on like missions all the time that meant nothing, 
But for whatever reason, at the time, the battle space owner thought that that was a good mission for CA. Right. And then they have PSYOP go in there, too. And PSYOP's only mission that was they'd have to show up and see the horrible shit. And they get on their fucking speakers and go, you know, yella, yella emshi. Yeah. They put the turp on the yeah. fucking loudspeaker, yeah. <laughs> telling all the Iraqis to fucking to go, get, get out of here. Leave, yeah. Fucking, yeah, it's weird. But that yeah. was like, talk about total misuse by the commanders. Yeah. Like, by the battle space And that's just, that's, I... Probably more than anything, just, I mean, one, the battle space commander not knowing who else to send us. Like, okay, well, we've got we've got these people who aren't doing anything right now. But right. also, two, just a lack of education in terms yeah. of how to best yeah. employ and deploy. You, you have any stories like that, Zach, like frustration out on, on deployment where you're just like, why are we being used to do this? I don't. Um, <laughs> I, I've heard a lot of stories from, like, other, like, psyopers. Um Mostly attached to ODAs, where like people that no, were, come on. Maybe the ODA commander doesn't know how to like masters of chaos mis yeah. misusing assets. No way. <sighs> we're like maybe like you know, and we send we tend to send some junior guys on on missions that maybe they're not totally ready yet for mm -hmm, you. Mm -hmm. And so you, you attach them to ODA, and they're not good at like their elevator speech or like their case brief or what they bring to. The table, and they spend six months in Afghanistan as gate guards, Oof. or something like, you know, or like something not really not in job. line with yeah. yeah, yeah. So we we get a little bit of that, but it's been getting better. But yeah, yeah. 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 Well, what were some of your more memorable missions that that stick out in your mind? You know, I know you can't necessarily get into specifics, but saying you were in a country working with a element doing. Um, a thing. A thing. <laughs> Afghanistan was was good. Like that's where I cut my teeth. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it, it's challenging because like you, you look back and like what progress did you make? Like what did you do? Like th for the good of anything? Well, that's all of us though. Yeah, yeah. And you're like ah, nothing. You know, you know. Um, but uh, Iraq working with the Kurds was was good. Um, like the SDF and the, the YPG, YPJ. Um, I felt like we did some good work and cleared a lot of ISISs, you know? Doing counter ISIS, you know, propaganda, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Um, countering their narrative or trying to like shut down their narrative mm -hmm. or just, you know, like a, a lot of brand building and like promoting the SDF. How do you go about doing that on the ground? So a lot of what I did, again, was like advise and assist. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a lot of issues in the beginning with them using inappropriate social media posts. Um, I've seen them, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, so then we go, so you'd start from there and then you'd start trying to like build a narrative and a brand of like who they were and then try to spread awareness. And it was one of the things where like the world kind of cared we're talking like 2017, 2018. Um, people are a little sick of ISIS stories, but like SDF stories or YPJ, the, the female Kurds, people were still very interested in. So just you know, being able to like tell their story and like spread awareness was a, was a good thing for me. You know, I got to go and hang out with uh, YPJ sniper unit back in 2014. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Spent a few days with them. Well, it's like it was early on in the war before like we had any you know, America had yeah. any, like, official presence over there. But uh, definitely a very eye-opening experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, awesome unit, yeah. Yeah, and, for, and from, a, uh, from your perspective of what you do, I mean, it, on paper, it, it should be easy because these were young women going out and slaying some really bad people. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, on paper, it should be pretty easy. Yeah, keeping them in the news and, like, yeah. some very attractive. Yeah. Um, I think people just could, like, it just gets saturated and people just stop caring. It's like a mm -hmm. 24 hour news cycle. It's yeah. hard to keep people to like be interested in what the story that's going on right. consistently right. for years on end. Yeah. So just getting it back into the news and getting it, getting people to care consistently is a challenge. But you're talking like internally in Syria and Iraq. Or are we talking no, about like regionally, Middle, like Middle Eastern world? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Middle Eastern, Western, you know. That was our biggest challenge, by far. Yeah. So you would help them stand up like social media platforms and things like that? To... So they already had all that in place. They're actually pretty social media savvy. They're just, um, 
you know, it's more glory and war right. than like right. it, we're actually yeah. helping the people. Right. So like just trying to shift their narrative from like, look at all the ISIS as we slay it yeah. to like, <laughs> right. holy shit, school books and Raqqa. Right. You know, right. which is something else that they did. And it was just like, just getting that, like, the narrative to shift a little bit. That's right. interesting to hear because they struck me when I, I met with them, um, they, they had a much, much stronger ideological bent than like we ever were oh, in the United States. Oh yeah, States. for sure, for sure. Um, and that they were very much all about like, we're creating a new community, a new yeah, type of governance. Yeah. And it's interesting to hear that, you know, from, from when you were there, that that's not the message they were putting forward. So their, the official message has always been pretty on, on brand mm -hmm. and pretty good. But if you start looking at it a little bit and start pulling out the individual members, like Instagrams and Twitters, that's where it starts falling apart. Okay, I got you. And that's where you got to start, like, you're trying to get an individual curated a little bit. Curated, we'll put out yeah. policy and things like well, this that. Is, this is where yeah. you know you get into that notion of the strategic corporal, and like you're yeah. trying to, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. 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 interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's weird how social media kind of like drives what's going on now, where you can basically see everything that's going on. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah, like, like you know, yeah. if you want to see video from the Battle of Raqqa or whatever, you can find that. Like you know, can you imagine if they had that fifteen years ago? Yeah, you know, it's you have snippets of video that are out there that came from different battles, and yeah. you know, I think maybe the battle for like when they were retaking like uh, Baghdad, there was that was like the first time. You saw more footage, and that would be because of like CNN was there and all that. Yeah. But it wasn't due to social media. Right. Now, you, I mean, I can't even tell you how many Iraqis that I knew that I'm friends with on Facebook. Yeah. On Instagram. Like, yeah. You know, I get these friend requests from little squiggles, and I'm like, who the fuck is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's Speedy. I haven't seen yeah. Speedy in 15 years. Yeah. And he found me on fucking Facebook. But, yeah. Um, yeah. It's. It would have been better if we had social media back then, because the document, like the way to document the war, seems to be through between, between it, social media and drone footage. Like when everything's declassified, like this, these wars are going to be better documented than anything in history. Yeah, yeah. both the yeah. good, the bad, and the ugly. Like it's all going to come out in the wash. I feel like. Yeah. Well, I think that the other thing too is that it would have been very detrimental if they had social media back then, because like you and I were talking about this at the Legion last time, like. The amount, and I was talking to the colonel today, the amount of, like, civilians that were killed by us. Like, you, you yeah. talk about what's happening yeah. now with Trump pardoning these guys and, you know, with that guy, the, was he 82nd, that was in uh, Leavenworth, the lieutenant? Oh, yeah, it may have been. Yeah, and then, like, you know, what these guys did. And I remember very vividly, and we were talking about it today, do you remember, you ever heard of a term called salacia payments? No. Salacia payment was a CA thing. And salation payment was when we would have to meet up with like a local nationals family if somebody was killed. Yeah, yeah. And it was blood money. Yeah. And, yeah. But I yeah. totally forgot. So I called, that was one yeah. of the things I called him about today. So he didn't remember where the money for salation payments came from. It wasn't SERP funding. SERP just went out the window everywhere else. Like, just fucking. Well, oh, you know the way. It rain you, you know the way they handled SERP, uh, SERP funding was that it's illegal as fuck. Yeah. No. The way that was handled. Because SERP funds were issued out specifically for the reconstruction of Iraq, congressionally mandated. Yeah. And, like, when con Congress mandates funding, it's not like any other types of funding that, like, the unit has discretion. Yeah. It's like, no, it's for that one thing. Yeah. And the way that these commanders are paying off MOLAs is illegal as fuck. Fuck. No, the awakening councils and all that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. But the salation payments, like fucking, like I forgot about this. Like I, I kind of, I, I texted you about it, and like, so I, I wanted to call him because he was at the forefront of doing this, right? So a salation payment would be, we would have to meet up with the local national. It would either, if it was, if you were lucky, it would have been a representative of the local national's family. Right. Ninety nine percent of the time, it was like a local national's actual family. Salation payment for a male, like a military-age male that was killed accidentally or whatever, like basically if they pulled a 556 five, slug out of a fucking dead guy or whatever, and they could tie it back to the coalition, mm -hmm. it was $2,500. That's what they got. Mm -hmm. They got $2,500 US dollars. But I forgot about this. So if it was a woman, it was more. Really? Yeah. And if it was a kid, it was even more. And if there were multiple kids, it was a multiplier and it was more. But apparently, if it was a, um, if you weren't killed, 
but you were like fucked up. Mm -hmm. Like if you got shot up and you survived or whatever, it was more than anything else. Like, and so like they would sit there and you would have to sit down with these fucking people and almost negotiate mm -hmm. what you felt would be fair. Like, so like if you got shot in the neck and you went to Jesus hospital city, Christ. Yarmouth, like Yarmouth Hospital, and you ended up getting out and you were I mean, paralyzed. it's basically like insurance companies in the U.S. now. Yeah. And we were doing that. Yeah. And like you were sitting there and that was a big fucking deal. And you were having these fucking local nationals come on. I remember fucking having local nationals walk on to a cop or a fob and sit down. There had to be a JAG officer there. That was yeah. a big fucking, that was a big part of it. So you have a CA guy, maybe a maneuver unit guy or, or you know, an ODA team chief or whatever. But I had to have a JAG guy. And then you have to sit there, and then you have to barter. And JAG is uh, military law enforcement, or military attorney. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, and the, sit there the and barter. But I forgot that there was different prices for different people. So I remember, like, very vividly, like, fucking multiple, multiple occasions where, like, fucking, like, civilians were just fucking wasted for no good reason. Like, they drove a little too fast behind a convoy or fucking whatever. Man. See, that, that gets, I mean, that gets so hard, though, because after... <clears throat> You know, uh, what was that freeway that ran from uh, the Green Zone to... Uh, Rhode Irish. Yeah, yeah, Irish. So after, you know, as when you're a maneuver element, you get pretty testy, you know, like after two or three cars, you know, with, you know, uh, VBIDs ran into convoys, you know, that... And then you put, you know, then in these, especially these conventional units, you put these 18-year-old kids on these, on these 50 cows in the back yeah. of a Humvee, and they've got the signs that say, you know, stay at least, you yeah. know, 100 meters back, 50 meters back, whatever it said. Um, and, you know, it, it, I, you know, and the, I think that the threat to civilians was always highest right after one of those, because everybody was on high alert. Everybody was yeah. like, well, I, look... I want to go home. I want my buddies to go home. And here comes this car, like ignoring the sign because they ignore those signs all the time. Yeah. You know, yeah. they ignore those signs all the time. Uh, even you know, uh, I don't know. I like that. That was tough. Man, I, that was I, a I, tough I situation. About, I mean, like, be very candid about it. I mean, I wrote about it in my book in 2005 in Missoula. Um, You know, as great a job as I think the guys I worked with did. One of the things I really disagreed with was uh, that these guys, a lot of the gunners were just lighting up cars left and right. Yeah. Like anybody who got too close to us. And I mean, we're talking like fucking families of five just fucking hosed. Yeah. yeah. Hosed oh, down. And yeah, there's some people who got to live with that shit. Like I'm not going to fucking like call anybody out by name or anything like that. I'm just saying that there were some things that, in my opinion, happened that shouldn't have uh, happened. Um, and... I didn't say anything about it because it actually was within our ROE. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. That if the vehicle gets too close to the convoy, you know, we don't know what's a VBIED. We don't know what is. See, it. that's the thing. You're either you're either a hero or a zero in that yeah. case, right? right? And, right. And, and and chances are nobody's ever going to know. But there were some guys who were like just sadistic, and they they just wanted to fucking hose down brown yeah. people. Well, that I mean. I think at that point it becomes a commander's responsibility to be able, you know, or through his subordinate leaders to be able to identify these people and keep them off the well, guns. Well, it was really interesting because the pink team, which is a conventional army uh, helicopter unit, aviation, yeah. uh, the Kiowas, they were seeing all this stuff from the air. They were complaining about it. And uh, I remember my squad leader calling all of the, uh, the, the crews from the strikers into the conference room one night. And he asked us, he's like, Okay, so, like, if you're driving down the street and you just, like, fucking are shooting up, like, families, you know, like, cars full of families, who's the good guy and who's the bad guy in that situation? And uh, I, was, I looked at him, I was like, we're the bad guy in that situation. And there's another team leader uh, in my platoon, and he was like, I don't give a fuck. It was straight up, like, I don't give a fuck. And my yeah. squad leader was like, really, you don't give a fuck at all. And on one hand, like, maybe he should have reined him in, but at the other hand, it's like, he couldn't counteract the ROE. Right. There's nothing a squad leader can do to say you cannot fire. Right. So how does that play out? How right. should have that played out? Well, right. It's also that weird, like especially in that time frame, is that weird two part thing. Like people didn't take into account that like Iraqis didn't fucking drive 
like before yeah. the invasion. Like yeah. There was like, remember how many cars were on the streets in like 04, 05? It, it, yeah, and the other side of that is like, you'd be driving in a convoy of like five strikers and that car with like family of six would pull in between two strikers right. and like doing, like why are you driving like that? Because they were right. driving like that. Right. Because right? they didn't know how right. to fucking drive. And then you had a multitude of motherfuckers out there, uh, specifically probably like platoon leaders or whatever, that would give that old adage, what was it like fucking, uh, it's better to be judged by nine and counted right, by right, six. Right, like, right, yeah. And that was the thing that would always go around. And so these young kids would be there and they'd be like, yeah, man, like that car gets too close. Like this is my fucking thin red line. And if it gets close enough, boom, I'm going to light and it up. I, I have one of my privates who was on the gun and the striker. Uh, we had a car try to charge through our, beast, our, our blocking position. And so he followed the ROE and he lit up the car and killed the guy. And it was a civilian just being a dumbass, just running the. Running. Yeah, but he, but he can't take that chance. No, he, he didn't know. Yeah. He didn't know. And he and I know I knew this guy. He was in my squad. I mean, yeah. good dude. Yeah. He's still a good dude today. Um, really good guy. And I remember um, when I wrote about it in my in my book, I asked him because I was I was like writing about him, not by name, but I was like, what do you think about this? And I, I specifically recall him being asked, one of the privates asked him, like, how, how, you just killed a man, how do you feel about that? And he said, you know, I recall him specifically saying, not so good. When I ran that by him and asked him, he's like, oh, I don't remember saying that. And I think maybe he was in a little bit of shock himself. Yeah. But I mean, this is kind of like the nitty gritty of war, man, that like yeah. doesn't get talked about so often. Well, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, it, it's the same thing as, as squirters off a target. You know, are they, are they, are they a squirter? Or just some dude that's scared. Are, 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 yeah. Is it somebody who's scared who's running? Mm -hmm. Or are they a maneuver element? Are they running to a cache, you know, to, to grab, you know, to grab yeah. something and then open fire? Because I mean, that's happened, you know, that's happened to me and it's like, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll give you full disclosure. I mean, I'm not gonna like. I was involved in an event uh, where we had uh, a couple California National Guard guys attached because we were so short-handed. It was right around the time when guys were going on leave, and I was involved in an event with a local national taxi. And you know, accidents happen. Cars park too close to park convoys on the side of the street, and you know, people misjudge, and the Iraqis are looking one way and their tunnel vision or whatever. Things happen, like fucking, like, it's just, it, it was, at the time, in 2004, I think it was happening a lot, because I remember when the directive came down from command, and that would have been, like, January or February, like, I remember what happened when fucking the 82nd Airborne came in, the elections were a big deal, Yeah, and it was a huge vote, yeah. it was the first yeah. Iraqi election, Yeah, and CA was in charge of, we played a very big role with the polling sites and all that shit. Yeah. So they sent the 82nd, I think it was 10505, came in to Baghdad and they put a group of those guys out at Headhunter. Dan Rather flew in to Baghdad, like in, they were all there, but Dan Rather went to Headhunter. They walked out of Headhunter and they walked down the road and within like fucking 15 minutes, somebody from the fucking 82nd smoked the guy and completely unarmed and they caught it on camera. It was on the fucking CBS Evening News that night. Because the tensions were so fucking high, I think that after the elections and all that, the command was like, like, and I mean, when I talk about the command, I mean probably the command back in the Pentagon was like, this is way out of control. And if they probably started looking at paperwork with salation payments and the yeah. amount of civilians that were getting wasted because there was complete disregard for, like, they were, like, disregard for civilian lives or whatever. I think I remember one of the big things was that there was a woman smoked on a bridge and they made up some excuse on why they did it. Yeah. And then after that, directives came down. I think I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And it was like, then all of a sudden, probably the first memes that ever came out were pictures of like lower enlisted guys from fucking, uh, what was it, you know, fourth ID that came in, or no, third ID that came in, of like taking fucking um, all their fucking PT belts and all that shit and wrapping mm -hmm. themselves up like that and like putting the fucking flashlights on their helmets and stuff and like, you know, having a bullhorn, like, just yeah. to, like, you know, warn civilians, like, it, you know, too it, close. It, it gets tough. It's the same, it's the same thing when, you know, when you're rolling through a soccer <laughs> city or you're, you know, rolling through some, some town, you know, village in Afghanistan or whatever, and you see somebody sitting there watching you with a cell phone in their hand and not yeah. talking on it, but just with it, it's like, you know, like you, yeah. what is that? Yeah. What, what is, what yeah. is the call to make here, you know? 
because you, you have no idea what they're doing. And if you make, if you make the wrong call, you, you kill an innocent person. If you make the wrong call, you know, some, somebody blows up your convoy and you just lost a couple buddies because you, you didn't pull the trigger. So like it, it it's, it's a very, it, it, I mean, it was a, it's a very, very challenging environment yeah. to operate in. Yeah. Because um, the enemy's not wearing uniforms. Right. You know, yeah. you know, and, and the thing is, is it like, how many of the V bids, you know, the rolling V bids that hit convoys and took casualties, how many of those got to the convoy because the gunner didn't shoot? Because thought, well, I've seen this before. It's probably nobody, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to yeah. light them up, you know. So it, it just it like gets to be really, really challenging when you tell people to stay back and they don't stay back, like, it, you know. Um, it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Yeah. yeah. It's like, I didn't pull the trigger, or, or this happened last time, so now I have to. Yeah. Right. You and know? if you have a sign written in their language, you know, how are you supposed to know that that person doesn't know how to read? Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, and like, he's probably seen that sign plenty of times. So yeah. I'm pretty sure that he knows what that means, even if he can't read it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, well, I mean, it's also like common sense should tell you that, you know, you're driving with your wife and kids. Probably you don't pull between these two fucking 12-ton strikers. Right. And also, uh, look, if, if if it had never happened that somebody with their wife and kids in the car hadn't blown themselves up, because I'm, I'm sure it has, right? Yeah. Um, then, then, you know, then the gunners would see a car with a family and go, okay, well, that's, that's just, you know, that guy's no threat. But you can't even take that on faith value. Yeah, oh, I understand. You know? I, I understand. Like, I, I, I feel like, you know, like a gunner position on, on a, you know, on a tactical vehicle is such a low ranking position. You know? It's like, it's <laughs> the like PSC. a shit yeah. position, yeah. Yeah. you know, you put the, you put your cherry up there yeah. a lot of times and, but it's really the position with the most responsibility. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Dude, I remember the JSOC commander and command sergeant major coming up to Missoula from Tikrit and like lecturing us. Well, not lecturing us, but it was like, I guess it was more like they were checking the block. They like came up there because we were like all these people we were killing and they came up there and like sat us all down in the conference room like, we're just here to make sure you guys are okay. And we're all kind of looking at them like, the fuck does that mean? <laughs> like, why are you here? You know, like we couldn't really piece it together. And I guess it was just one of those things they got enough complaints from the conventional army guys they felt they had to come up and check the block. I, I don't know, but yeah, just yeah. weird, you know? Uh, you want to you want to get some questions? Yeah, man. Uh, let's take a little a brief interlude from all this morbid war talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, you want to talk about what's uh, being drank tonight? Yeah. So Jack's about to drink some Jameson. At uh, I am. Yeah. Um, Zach is drinking. I drank all of Jack's Lafroy. Yeah. You finished the Lafroy? Yeah. Uh, you got. You have to present the. the oh yeah. So yeah. that's what Jack uh, Zach drank. The yeah. Thing. Lafroy. Yeah. And now. Uh, Jack is going to drink this. Jim. <laughs> because every time Jack and I hang out. And I was drinking the New Belgium Trapel. That was good. Uh, now I'm drinking the Oak Spire Bourbon Barrel Ale. This is uh, not really my thing. It's a little too sweet. Uh, yeah, so I'm having that that sweet thing right now. I, I, I wanted to save our Lafroy for the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's got smooth notes of toffee, <laughs> vanilla, and caramel. It's the toffee that does it for me. And the caramel also, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, save the Lafroy for our guest tonight. Um, Thank you. Right. Hey, Cheers, guys. Cheers, guys. Thanks for having us. In our us. bootleg green or blue plastic cups here. Uh, we'll have to do a little bit better for next, but we're on a budget, all right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which uh, brings up our Patreon. Uh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> thank you for joining us tonight, or if you're watching this video after we put it out, um, please remember to like this video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Uh, and if you click that notification bell, um, you might get alerted when we go live or when we put out new content. Uh, you might, you might not, who knows? Uh, it's up to YouTube. Um, uh, and we have a Patreon channel. The link is in uh, yeah. the description yep. of the video. It's in the description if you want to check that out. Uh, if you join, there's already exclusive content on there. Uh, there's also an awesome welcome video. Yes, sir. Uh, we got it in one take. You'll probably be able to tell. <laughs> you'll, tell. <laughs> you'll know we got it in one take. Um, and uh, uh, and there's more exclusive content coming. Uh, what, 
What, what was the exclusive We're, we're going to get into oh, his... <laughs> so Josh deployed to the Congo with civil affairs. But we can't tell the story here. We're not going to tell the story about the hookers. That's going to be on the patron page. All right. Yeah, so we can talk a little bit about... We'll talk about the rest of this. Some of the other stuff. All the points. Let's look at some questions. All right. Let's take some questions from uh, uh, the audience. Oh, Andrew wanted a vigorous debate over berets. Oh... Talk about the new gray beret? Psyop. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. Civil Affairs thinks they're getting the gray beret also. Oh, we're both gray. Wait, so psyop has got a gray beret? That's the no, one that was coming down the pipe. It's, it's in the works. Okay. Yeah. There's a push for it. Because they're the gray man? <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah, they are the gray man. Yeah, like when, I was, in, when I was in, that was a rumor. So I got out in February. Um, and they're like, some people were fired up about it, some people didn't really care. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of in the latter camp. I mean, wouldn't it be more appropriate if, though, if Slaps and Simple Fairs got, like, uh, like, like, carrot red, or, you know, or, or like, <laughs> bright red berets, you know? Not the maroon airborne berets, but the bright red for the red-headed stepchildren. <laughs> you know, kind of carrot, carrot orange or whatever. Um, uh, yeah, berets are always fun to talk about since they change every we love the fight about you, them how shaped was your beret oh, did, my you, beret. did you shave it and this was a this lot is, your he was a black beret, beret. i was a black beret. Oh, oh, yeah 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 our berets was it was it like baseball cap and flop oh, or was it like straight up it was straight up yeah it was straight up and flopped like hard it was shaped shaved <laughs> yep. oh yeah i always love the guys with like the baseball no that's yeah, just like goes far yeah it should it should be straight up but you you you're saying you had it flopped over like the the ear of who did, did it cover it did it cover the, uh, yeah. the eye just slightly just yep. just, 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 just off the corner yeah yep. I'll bring my beret in sometime <laughs> I still have it you should put it on the wall I should yeah. I should no. Um, but yeah no mine we had a kid who shaped and shaved went to a vanilla ice concert and he stole the silver skull off the drum set. And we Fantastic. tacked it up in our squad AO and put a we, we put a uh, tan beret on it because I was a tan beret guy by the time no. I got there. Cherry. Yeah. <laughs> new, new school. Uh, but I but I did take the brass out of my DUI and fucking rubbed it until it was all silver and got the gold off of it. I, was, oh, yeah? I wasn't that new. <laughs> um, and we ended up taking some shoe goo to glue that beret on there because. There's always some fucking formation that's like, oh, I forgot my beret. And they go take the beret off the silver vanilla yeah, ice skull. Yeah, yeah. So we ended up taking shoe goo and sticking it on there. So you should bring in pictures of that. We'll have to show them sometime. I might have. I don't know if I have pictures of it or not. You know, this is pretty social media. Yeah, and I'm not that new school. Dude. Yeah, yeah. This is yeah. 2000. I was in Ranger Battalion from 03 to I left in 06 when I when I went to the Q Corps. So we had we had uh, my my. Fuck face, what was it? MySpace. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. I was on yeah. MySpace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all were. That yeah. was, yeah. I was I mean, a big MySpace guy. I've never, right. never moved on from there. Yeah, I don't right. have anything now. So, yeah. so, do you have a MySpace music account now? Because no, that's what I they are now, right? They're music. <laughs> I think so, yeah. 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 Um, uh, let's see here. Um, as a former USR 38 Bravo, we support conventional now. Oh, this is Jacob King. Uh, so, th this kind of might be for you, Zach. Um, Oh, it's for both of you. So this is Jake. He's a former 38 Bravo. He says, do you think that uh, the effectiveness of a C uh, civil affairs and SIAP has been less effective as a result of a lack of policy? So there's a... Do you, do you see that group on Facebook? Are you on Facebook? There's no, I'm not. A civil affairs PSYOP group on Facebook. There's also a PSYOP meme page, which is fucking hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I bet that's great. You always yeah, say you're going to afford me these things because uh, I'm, I'm not on social, you know, I mean, I am on social media. I just never Well, you, you should be on social media so that you can promote this fucking live stream. I did. I sent it out tonight. I, I need you on their 24-7, like, nonstop stream of self-promotion. But then I'll become alt-right because, all, because social media, like, creates alt-right people. Embrace it. Just embrace <laughs> it. Just embrace it. All right? Shameless self-promotion. <laughs> Shameless self-promotion. <laughs> I've just been shameless. I forgot about the self-promotion part. I think that, like, uh, from what I'm seeing now, what people are putting on that is that they're talking about use of K-pop cutting the cord with use of sock in the respect that, like, yes, there is like some. It's it's not. It's it's a big drama because SF wants to absorb you guys. Yeah. Because they see yeah. you getting uh, the cyber mission, 
And, and, and honestly, yeah. it's all about money. They just yeah. want the billets yeah. and they want the funding that yeah. comes with the cyber yeah. mission. Yeah, I mean, with, with everything else that happens at SWIC and Special Forces Command, it's all like... Everybody wants that sweet, sweet NSA money. So yeah. I, I, I think we're limited. Yeah. Like, I think cyber's more not limited so much by policy, where like, I think it's more like people's expectations of what we are. Uh -huh. Like, we're seen as like this weird dark art, like, mind control group, you know? Like, there was that... MK Ultra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you like, know there was that, that senator that, that accused us of... It was like 2009, you know what I'm talking about? No. Um, a group of senators were going out to Iraq, and like the, the command show at the time was asking Saab basically to create like talking points for him to like talk to them about. And like all these senators came back and they were like, we got psyop I don't know what's real anymore. And like it's a list of talking points, like come on. You know, so like, I don't think it's really a positive, I think it's more like Saab needs to be more like open about what it is and what like the capabilities are because people think it's like some weird black magic right, and it's right, like, right. it's not at all. You know, so I, I, think it's, I think it's people's perception of PSYOP that like limits it and people are like, we gotta keep this box or it's gonna get real weird and they're gonna control us. And it's, you know. Is, I, it, is it ironic that PSYOP has a branding issue? <laughs> <laughs> Very. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. is this? Yeah, yeah, this oh, completely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so MedCap is like when the Navy sends uh, our hospital ships to make port calls in poor countries. Yeah, basically. Kind of. Uh, yeah. Kind of, but I would say the only thing that would be different is that if you were to send the Navy to do like a port call for a mission mm -hmm. like that, it would just be like a impact mission. Uh, where if you were going to do a med cap and you were on a sustained, like, long-term mission in a certain area, you would do more than one. Okay. You would do follow-ups. So it'd be more, that would, where the hearts and minds would be, you'd be trying to correlate a whole mm -hmm. mission that would encompass an area where you can get the guys to all be on your side. Where if you show up in Haiti after a fucking earthquake, you have, that's a humanitarian mission. Right, you know? okay. Um, and, and Zach, there are multiple uh, people here Referring you to as a uh, Fabio here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, my last day was uh, January thirty first. I just haven't cut my hair since. That's just where I'm at now. <laughs> nice. That's okay. It's a lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, it's a lifestyle. Embrace it. Uh, David Garcia says, "I know SFABs are new and all, but how is uh, CA supporting SFABs?" I actually don't know that. Uh, I, I I would assume that. There are some I don't even know what an SFAB is. The special... Oh, they're kind of fuck. stealing the UW mission. Yeah. Well, they're not stealing. I'm sure Green Berets are handing... They can't, uh, they can't okay. hand that shit over yeah. fast. So, so yeah, that's basically, the, yeah. The, the SFAB is General Milley's baby, and basically what he saw was that SF... Uh, so, like, FID is huge. It's a huge mission yeah. now. And SF can't possibly do it on their own. I mean, that's why in Iraq you had conventional army units doing FID missions left yeah. and right. right. Yeah. They were doing more FID than we were. Yeah. So he's, he had this idea, it was like, okay, SF trains foreign special forces units, so we will have a conventional FID unit to train conventional. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. SF trains conventional units too. Sure. So his, his thesis is kind of bullshit um, from the get-go, but I understand his point where he's like, like this mission set is too big for just SF, right sure. now we need yeah. more people. So that's what the, the SFAB does. Well, I, I, I specifically remember <laughs> Trying to uh, trying to hand over a a large border control point to an SF team, like a fully trained, fully equipped like border control point to an SF team, and they're like, "We don't do that. We're direct action." So wow, <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's as much because SF is a is a, it's a large. It, there are a lot of dudes in SF. <laughs> Um, way more than Rangers, um, uh, and uh, I don't know if it's as much as SF can't do all that work, or if they just they don't, don't want, want to. to. Yeah. Now, when the wars wind down, if you know, if the wars eventually wind down, um, it goes back to like the nineteen. It goes back, yeah. yeah. Then SF is going to be clawing for that stuff back because that's where all the funding is going to be. Oh, JSOC too. I mean, they like when things wind down, they go looking for fit missions. Sure. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, everybody. You know, everybody's going to take the top of what they can get. Yeah. But like when their doors to kick in, nobody wants to do fit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. You know what I mean? I so, want to be number one, man. Oh, all right. SFAB yeah. to 
don't know, my, the impression that I got like a year ago or like from people that I knew that had like gone there or like people that were trying to stop people from going there <laughs> was like, so SFAB was a little bit cannibalistic in that it was like a, a quick route to like promotion if you were like we're basically E6, SF. E7, and any of the soft MOSs, they were like, fucking come on, quick path to promotion this way. And that was like their big recruiting. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so they were seen as like the cannibal in the room for a little bit. So do they yeah. fall under conventional or do they fall under SOCOM? Or you saw under them? conventional, yeah. Under, okay. I think they have a different color hat. They do. Yeah. And there's, right. a, there's a big fucking shitstorm about that because yeah. when it was first released, it looked suspiciously like a green beret. <laughs> so they changed the color from like a from like a baby puke green yeah. to like an actual brown. Uh. Yeah. Um, so is C is Civil Fair supporting S Fabs uh, at all? I don't know. So far I mean, I can know? find out. I'll let you know the next time you guys are on. Uh, I would assume so. Like, I mean, there's not a lot of people on the ground in Afghanistan. Yeah. And like the yeah. units that are on the ground in yeah. Afghanistan right now would be like S Fab. I believe like. What they're doing, obviously, is like making sure that fucking SF guys are not getting shut up by a bunch of fucking Afghans that are training to become Afghan uh, Afghan army. Yeah. The CA would be right in the middle of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not for any other reason than just to be on a base where they can be safe enough. Yeah. But there wouldn't be a lot of CA in a, a, like floating around Afghanistan. I don't think there's a lot of anybody floating around Afghanistan. Does contractors. The- uh, yeah. Yeah. Does the mock embassy part include a cocktail party? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it should. <laughs> so I can imagine if you were sent to, is it at MIS? MIS? MIST. MIST. Yeah. I can imagine if you were sent to a MIST unit that nobody at the MIST, it, it was seen as like a cake job, like the, like, to do the embassy stuff and nobody wanted to go from there to Afghanistan? Oh, there's definitely, yeah. I mean, there's definitely guys that just want the MIST jobs and then... So like when I got to that point of the course, there's also guys that have like, I don't know, clearly never worn anything but like sweatpants or ACUs in their life. And they're like, like day one, it's like dress professional. And so many guys wore the, um, uh, the 5'11s. No, what are the, like, the plastic shoes, like the... Oh, yeah, the Corcorans shoes. or whatever? Yeah. They, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so many people showed up in those and... Wearing the, what? The Corcorans, like your dress, your yeah, dress, your dress shoes. Yeah, your dress shoes. Oh, The yeah, ones where you have the boots. Yeah, the, yeah. Like, so many guys wear those, and they're like, well, I have these. And you're like, no, you can't wear those in the real world. <laughs> 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 did, they, did they give you a clothing budget at all? Not for the course. No. Okay. Okay, but if you run a miss, then yeah, yeah, but like nobody ever gets it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you submit for it, and like three years later, you get a quarter of it somehow. Like, yeah, nobody ever actually gets it. It's not a real, yeah. But for the course, it was just like just show up business casual, and then for the final presentation, like business professional. Yeah, everyone wore like local. Andrew mm-hmm. wants to know: Has Psyop attempted to mimic some of the structures of political campaigns, such as having a dedicated rapid response communications personnel? Yes and no. Um, the issue again is like, uh, like the the military approval process is, is just it's very slow. So like you'll have a lot of go getters within PSYOP that'll have all these ideas, and like again like I don't I don't necessarily disagree with it because people are so afraid that like somebody could influence the U.S. population that there's all this red tape implied, and like like we kind of joked in Afghanistan that we were the, the IO information operations quick reaction force. Yeah. Cause it was like a joke. Cause it was like, people want us to do stuff and I'm like, yeah, I'll get it to you in three weeks. Yeah. Right. You right. Know? So it's, it's just really like the, it's the process involved. That yeah. It down. Yeah. But people have had similar ideas. Yeah. So Andrew, uh, he says, uh, so let's say Fabio was hypothetically in charge of psyops as part of the invasion of Grenada. How would he have gone about that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's a, I mean, that's a tough one. Like when you're not like tactically on the ground and like getting people to like trying to get people to move where you want them to do that. Like, that's simple. It, it's, it, it's the bigger picture stuff that SOP tries to do or that they do do that is, it's just, that's where it gets tricky. Um, and it really is like, 
I don't disagree with like the laws in place where like you can't influence U.S. citizens right, right. or like non-combatants. <coughs> but then, how do you segregate that? And how do you like get that done? Right, right. And that's so that's so tricky, especially in like the modern world. Right. Because it, I mean, modern day influence operations are online, and anything online has the propensity to be yeah. seen by yeah anybody anywhere. Yeah, and like I mean, like I mean, I don't know. That's the you guys were just talking about like. People being a little bit trigger happy. We had an incident in like what, 2015, 2014, where like PSYOP dropped a leaflet where we put a Taliban flag on a dog. I remember that. Yeah, and it made international news because there's a, it's a Quran verse in the Taliban flag. And like offended everybody, and like the commanding general had to like, like everyone had to apologize up to almost like the presidential level. And like I knew the guys that were on that team, and like their careers were ruined. Yeah. They were done. Yeah. And like, they didn't fucking know. Like, yeah. they're just like, yeah. we put their fucking flag on a dog because we were killing them like dogs. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. no one, like, there wasn't that much thought put into it. It yeah. was like, a, we needed something right now and we made something right now and now we're all fucked. Yeah. So, yeah, like, I don't know, man. Like, what? Well, yeah, I mean, like you said, I mean, when there's like, you know, 2,000 people a day in Russia or Iran or uh, China or wh wherever it is making memes and stuff like that. Yeah. And like none of them are going to be held accountable if something's like a little bit offensive. You right. Know? Yeah. right. And like we, and like, I, I don't disagree that we shouldn't match that, but it's also like we, I don't know, like we got to be in the fight. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's tough, man. It's real tough. Like, I don't know where to, I don't know what the oh, good solution is. Do you, uh, in like, do you feel that, or, and I don't know if this is part of like, do you feel like the like Gen Z tends to be more media savvy in the sense that like they're not as easily influenced because they've seen it all or I don't know. I, I think I think culturally it, it it differs depending on where you're at. Okay. Um I, I think like if you go to Afghanistan, like the sites and stuff that the Afghans pay attention to, they have a lot of faith in. Like yeah. way more than like we would. Yeah, yeah. You know, like we like we might look at you might go to BuzzFeed or the Chive and be like, eh, yeah, it's yeah. kind of funny. Like they put a lot of faith into like the Pashtu websites that are dedicated to Afghanistan. Okay, um, that's tough. So I it mean, really yeah, that's, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, Sean Hastings asks, generally speaking, who usually ends up joining civil affairs and psyop? Soft units like Rangers and Special Forces, or people from conventional units? So, I think that, like, from what I saw in my tail end time in the Army, like, there were a lot of guys coming off of active duty mm -hmm. or thinking about coming off of active duty who came from, like, Ranger Regiment or whatever. It's a nice transition. Like, so there was a guy named, um, you might actually know him. Do you know a guy named Joe Roberts? I think so. Uh, what does he look like? Is it like bodybuilder? Yeah. 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 I know. Yeah. So Joe was, yeah. a, he was a CA guy, and like he was a ranger. Um, he'll tell you that that was the best movie ever made to go CA. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. I, I think it's like a mixed bag. I don't know about like can't speak to psyop, but yeah. I think that like for a lot of these guys, like to come out of that unit and go into a CA type of unit. Yeah. You can still operate. You can still you know go out and do missions and all that kind mm -hmm. of shit. Uh, you go away from that high op tempo. It's still a decent op tempo, but it's not anything remotely close to that kind of op tempo. Right. I mean, yeah. Well, all, all I would add to that, to, to caveat off of that, <laughs> uh, it is um, a lot of special forces officers end up in civil affairs because, mm -hmm. like, like you experienced coming from the X-ray program, is like they want to keep you in SOCOM if they yeah. can. Yeah. So you will have special forces officers, and as they get promoted and the pyramid becomes more mm -hmm. narrow towards the top, there's only so many places for them yeah. to go in SF. So if they're not immediately able to go and become like an SF battalion commander. They would go over and be a psyops commander somewhere or a uh, civil affairs commander. Somewhere. Oh yeah, you see the commanding yeah. officers yeah. when it comes to like use KPOC. They're all SF, you know, range yeah. regiment guys. Like, yeah. So I think it's a natural transition. It's a it's a nice transition for yeah. them because then you get to do like more different shit. You know. Yeah. Um, I don't think you see a lot of vice versa. I don't think you see a lot of guys coming out of CA or PSYOP and going into, you know, special forces or whatever. I think that yeah. it, it's the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it's a good way to finish your career. Yeah. You know? yeah. I think I think for SIOP in general, like on the enlisted side, I mean, you get a lot of like conventional forces, um, guys that want to be in a smaller unit, and then like they looked into it a little bit and they want to do something a little bit more like um, cerebral. On the officer side, though, because you need to, it's like SF, you need to be a first lieutenant promotable to apply. We did seem to have a lot of like ranger officers. Really? Yeah. Um, guys that. Which is completely counterintuitive, like some fucking ranger Wait, running a unit. Like ranger that. tabbed or, or guys from the. From, from, from Battle. Yeah, from Battle. Yeah. From Bell, yeah. Um, well, but it's kind of like. Like, I worked with one that was a great guy, Tony, who's one of the best officers we had. Yeah. Who, like, he worked with some SIOP units and he just thought they should have been, like, better utilized, better integrated. And he just had, he came in with an idea. Yeah. And, like, that was fantastic. He was great. And so he was able to sort of, like, uh, kind of have his vision and then, and then put that in action? Yeah. That's great. I mean that that kind of like cross pollinization probably would, would help would help both units quite a bit. Oh yeah. Um, <coughs> you know, and, and and even even having permanent CA or PSYOPs people at like regiment or at the battalion level yeah. uh, at you know not maybe at not at the group maybe at the group level or or, or I don't know um, in SF to where you get used to knowing how each other operates. And yeah. so you can, you know, you can, you can say, Hey, this is where we can help you. Like, it, it, you know, it can be more plug and play, uh, because you have a better idea of, of each other's, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. operate, you know, operational parameters. And well, it's yeah. one of those things. This is like one of the criticisms I would have of special forces is that there are some ODAs that like bring everyone into the team. Like, Hey, yeah. we're all working together here. Yeah. And then there are others that are like, Oh, you're not SF. You're a piece of shit. Oh. Yeah. Like I was saying before, looking at you sideways, like, who the fuck are you? Yeah. yeah. Why are you here again? Yeah. What the fuck do you? What, what do you do? What yeah. Are you? you know. So there, there are a, um, with an ODA. I mean, so much of what happens there depends on the personality. Sure. The team. Yeah. Sure. And even in a, in a in a squad in Ranger Battalion, sure. like, it just depends on like the group of guys you get in with. Yeah. And, like some are just like they get it, and some don't. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I, I, like SIOP has um, like planner positions with every other soft unit and like most conventional units, but if it's one guy. Yeah, and like the one guy at first group, do you think he actually gets out to the A teams, or like right. do you think he just sits there and like helps writes annexes? Right, right. Like he's not. And has he ever even really been operational on the? Well, my, with Siap, it's a little bit different. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, he could have been like realistically, he could have been a guy that did two missed rotations to fucking Taiwan or somewhere right. like Cherry and then they go to the first group and they're like what are you bringing right you know that, that realistically could be the thing yeah yeah um let's see if what else we have we have um okay so that they asked me oh Clint hey what's up Clint uh Dave did you have any CA or PSYOPs guys attached to your unit in Iraq um no uh no, I mean, uh, like, I mean, we, uh, no, we didn't. Um, I mean, like, I'm sure they'd be there if you needed them. Yeah, you well, know, like we'd work with, we'd work with yeah. different people uh, yeah. based on, on mission requirements or based on if, like, we found out, like, like, like I said, like, uh, we've been on med caps and we've been on some, you know, some CA stuff that, um, you know the like big army was supporting or whatever and then we would go out because you know there, there would there might be a mission there for us or whatever yeah. uh and it's a good way to get in you know well it's also you think about like with the med cap one of the bigger ca takeaways of that is passive intel right 100 yeah. passive intel is yeah. a massive yeah. part of 100 yeah. like so like we had a guy this guy harry they kind of just hung around with us all the time he was an sf guy uh former sf guy and I'm pretty sure he I, he was definitely an OGA guy. I'm not sure which A yeah. it was. Yeah. Uh, he glommed on to us. He liked CA. He would come out with us. And, yeah. And he would ask us a lot of questions about, initially when he first started coming around, he would go, uh, and this is in 2008, what's the price in Dora Market for a bag of potatoes or something like that or a bag of rice? And, you know, we go out on a mission or one of the teams would go out on a mission and they would get the price and they come back and give it to them. Mm -hmm. And eventually this guy, Harry, would come out with us, with his mm -hmm. turp. And then, you know, whenever our team would go out the door market, he'd kind of split off. 
and he'd go talk to some guy. And yeah. It was clearly like his way of going to meet some guy or whatever. Mm -hmm. But he would use that as us generating passive intel that he could feed back to whatever agency he was from. Right. And that's a very common thing where you would have guys use CA for something like that because in the doctrine of CA, passive intel is a big fucking deal. Right. I mean, that's... I, you write a report and there's more than one guy reading a report. Right. And you write a report after every fucking mission. You right. You come back and like, didn't matter what the fuck you were doing. You really might go to see a generator or like a power plant or a fucking a school or whatever and you'd write a report to come back and then for whatever reason, something that we wrote, he took interest in that. Right. And then all of a sudden... Well, both, both passive intel and it also gives like military intelligence units or whomever, you know, D D whomever else, it it gives them cover for action. Yeah. You know, it, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Is, yeah. it, is it gives them a reason to be in that village. Um, and I'm, and probably, uh, excuse me, I think probably one of the reasons that um, the CA like was under the spec ops sort of, uh, or one of the benefits, if not a reason, is that um, you're like the the CA mission could be directed. Hey, we want you guys to go to this village because we're prepping, because we're prepping this area, or like we have a mission two villages over or whatever. And you know when you like it, it, it's different. It was different in Iraq, I imagine, because I, I didn't really see CA operate in Iraq, but in Afghanistan, <clears throat> when they would go out to do to a village like a medcap or whatever, people would come. From my from vi from villages, word would get out so fast, and people would walk miles and miles and miles from other villages to come see, you know, an American doctor. Yeah, you yeah. know, um, miles. I mean, the lines would just be massive. Yeah, um, and a security fucking nightmare too. Oh, it one hundred percent. I mean, it's just one hundred percent. There's only so much you can do with that. Like, yeah. I mean, you can bring in local national, like local military, local police, yeah. or whatever, do outer cordon, but like. At the end of the day, if you have inner cordon provided by like Maneuver or an ODA or whatever, yeah. or CA or PSYOP or whatever, because yeah. at that time it would be a hodgepodge, yeah. you still have to rely on that fucking that IP unit or that Iraqi army unit on the outskirts to pat these motherfuckers down. 100%. Yeah. They're coming through. Yeah, like 100%. It, it is a huge security risk. And, and not, only, not only on site, but then you got to pack up and leave. Yeah. And that's when you're really like, that's when you're really vulnerable, I think, is yeah. like, um, because even though a good tactical process is never take the same way out as you take in, yeah. in a lot of places in Iraq and yeah. a lot of places in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. there's one way in, one way out. One egress route, and that's and, the same and, way And so, in, where, whichever way you went in, they know where you're coming out, you yeah. know? And it's like, oh my God, like, here we go. Yeah. So, we are like an hour and a half in, so if anyone out there has any questions, make sure you get them in. Um, but in the meantime, you know, I want to get hit up some more of the deployment stories. I think that's what people come for. <laughs> uh, so can you tell us a bit more? I mean, maybe you were, that's what you were talking about with Dave um, before I came back about being deployed to the Congo, because that's kind of a little bit different than Afghanistan and Iraq. No, so I, so the Congo was a weird mission. Like, um, I always wanted that mission. I was not not specifically Congo. I wanted a non Iraq Afghanistan mission. Sure. Yeah. And uh, it was to be my last mission. Um, and obviously, you find out other stuff about that. I'm not going to get into that here. But uh, so it was a small team, and there was different elements there. Um, you had. A medical element you had uh, that was it was a National Guard uh, medical unit, and there was some Marines for Camo, and there was like a there was a cell that set up for communication for everybody, like a headquarters cell. We weren't given a very good mission going into it all, but we figured it out. Um, Congo was a weird place. It was a uh, I I don't think I realized before I got there how many Chinese were there. I mean, massive amounts of Chinese. Like in my hotel, when we were in a hotel in Kinshasa, which was our base of operations, right outside this like consulate uh, embassy area, which was the safe zone. Mm -hmm. And we go out every day. We had a, a local national terp, and we kind of filtered down from the top of mission where we could go to like so in Iraq you have mohallas, which are like neighborhoods or mm -hmm. you know municipalities or whatever. 
Chicago has the same kind of thing, but I don't even remember what it was called, but it was controlled almost by warlords. So every part of the city in Kinshasa had different people that might call themselves mayors or whatever, but they were not mayors. They were like fucking strong arms. <laughs> yeah, little, little local <laughs> warlords. Like, that ate enough hearts of their enemies, and then all of a sudden now they control that network. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a big thing in CA, it's called Atmospherics, and I think yeah. PSYOP does the same yeah, thing, yeah. where you go around and you, you just collect as much uh, information about an area. You have meetings with local leadership, uh, local security, local health facilities or whatever. Uh, Congo was so inherently fucked up that I can't see how that country will ever come out of being the worst third world country in the world. It was really just like it. it I remember like the, the first day I was there, we got to the hotel and it's right by the side of the Congo River and a barge going from Kinshasa to Brazzaville overturned 100 thousand, like a uh, uh, hundred between, eight hundred to a thousand people like fucking spilled over into the fucking river. Oh my god. They rescued as many as they could and then everybody else died and everybody's like, yeah, you know what happens. <laughs> but, like, the, 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 the value of human life is very low. Yeah. And, uh, and so I come, I came to learn throughout my time when I was there that it's a very disease ridden, uh, very heavily divided place uh, where you can go from like one mahala to the other and there was like a blood feud between the two mayors. Like, it was interesting. It was a real true CA mission. I got to see the bonobo monkeys. They, the, the, the coordination was so poor that we actually took a fucking forerunner or a Hilux and drove fucking 40 minutes outside of Kinshasa just to go see these monkeys one day. We could have been kidnapped. We could have been <laughs> <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a good time. Um, and the weirdest mission I've ever been a part of. What? What? Was there a, a deterring factor that like separated the different neighborhoods? Was it just geographical? Were they family or tribally like affiliated? Like uh, like how how did that break down? So I think what it was in those neighborhoods was that like everybody that was in charge of the neighborhoods, and if a lot of them were in, uh, if they were women that were running the neighborhoods, um, came no from shit. older families in the area. And down with the patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really. Well, the thing is that like so Kinshasa is fucked up because. The rest of the country is way fucked up. So all the people that are leaving the jungles to get away from the war, the civil war is in Goma and out by the border, are coming into Kinshasa to find safe haven in just a horrible place, but yet it was so much better than where they came from. Right, right. And so we would like find that there were people that were almost Johnny Come Latelys in these neighborhoods, and they were so low on a totem pole that if your family had been there for at least like 60, 70 years, you might be top brass in that area. Really? And then really hate the people in the neighboring little area. Oh, really? Yeah. And um, and then you tack on like this, it's a very Christian country, like evangelical Christian. And so if your kid has like autism or ADHD or anything like that, you take your kid to the local minister. And they speak in tongues. And yeah, like no, that. it's even crazier than that. So the local minister goes... Yeah, this kid's Shege. Shege means sorcerer. You have to kick the kid out of the house. And now the kid is living on the street, and the street is filled with fucking, like, 15, 16-year-old kids, guys, uh, kid, uh, men and women. And they're drinking this thing called Patexia, which is a mixture between gasoline and glue. And they just walk around like zombies, and that's what Shege means. And they just fuck on the side of the streets, and they walk up to you and touch you, and, like really really weird and they're not even looking for money they just want to they see a white face and they come up to you like, uh, yeah, like <laughs> oh my god get the fuck <laughs> like fucking like spraying fucking antiseptic on my face and like <laughs> gasoline and glue I mean so Patexia is yeah it, is there any liquor in it at all or no. is it it's as fucked up as you would think it would be. It's like, a, like, so, it's like I mean I don't, it's so fucked up that I wanted to taste it but I, then I was like I'm not gonna drink gas. I'm good, bro. I'm good. <laughs> it's like, especially because this dude's mouth is on it, um, and it, it, they just shake it up in a bottle and drink it. Zach, you got any crazy ass deployment stories? Like now you got a you got a one up, Josh. <laughs> so I got, you got I got a one up that. that matches gas and gluten. Like I don't have like I don't know. I don't have any really good like individual stories. By the but way, like, that's what we're drinking right now. Gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. But like I. I 
I think so. I was I was only in for seven years, but I think like my biggest takeaways from it were like the difference between Afghanistan and Iraq, and like Afghanistan, it was like everyone was like was like tunnel vision on their mission. Because, like, the overall how do you make it better, like, nobody had any fucking clue. <laughs> and, like, it just felt like, if you look beyond, like, I gotta, I gotta achieve this, it looked hopeless as hell and no right, one, like, right. nobody wanted to deal with it. Right. Where, like, I was in Iraq for the invasion, I was there for clear Isis. Yeah. And, like, clear Isis was like, well, yeah, you should fucking get rid of them. Yeah. Kill them all. Yeah. And right, it was right. like... Wh which invasion? <laughs> <laughs> so I was, only, I was in Iraq in 2018, a little bit of 2019. Okay, so like when you say invasion, like we're oh, thinking like 2003. I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was there for any of that. Like, so I, don't, like, I have no idea. I was like, oh, where were you? But I was there. <laughs> but this, no, I have no idea. But this also that. raises an important question. Okay, okay. there's a, there's an important uh, takeaway from this in of itself is mm -hmm. that. You know, a couple, a year and a half ago, everyone was talking about, oh, great, Mosul is liberated, Mosul is liberated. Yeah. I'm like, who the fuck cares? That city's going to change hands another 10 oh, times yeah, in yeah, the yeah. next decade. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, like, you say invasion, and, like, you see how we're overlapping yeah. with each other. Oh, it's yeah. like, oh, hold on a second now. Well, yeah. No, because that's what I, that's, I literally thought you meant 2003. Yeah, so I wasn't, yeah, so I wasn't there for part of that. Yeah. I've only been in Iraq to, like, clear ISIS. And, like, like I said, like, leaving Afghanistan, like, there was a little bit of, like, Everything that left was like, we did our thing, everything's kind of hopeless. And yeah. like, no one, like, I did my job, bitch. Yeah, like, that's kind of how I heard it. And then, like, dealing with like, people that like, helped like, clear ISIS, everyone felt like we were on the we side of right. We literally did some yeah. shit. And just like how different like, those groups of people that I worked with like, and to, like, yeah. experienced it is, is like the craziest experience I've had in the army. By far, like wh why? You know, like you get deeper into you know what that was like to actually be there with uh, those people. I, I think it's just happened. like a, like a sense of purpose. We're mm -hmm. like Afghanistan. It's like it's rough. Like I don't know what I don't know what the exit strategy is. I don't know how you make that better. You know, and you know, like people are talking like we're clearing their poppy fields. They should grow saffron. They're like saffron doesn't grow here, and you're like grow saffron. Like then nobody has any fucking plan. Nobody has any clue. You know, or I don't know. We probably. Five years from now, we'll probably find out we didn't do did, did the command, did, did, did the commanders in Afghanistan even bother to try to articulate to you, like, what you're doing here? Oh, no, everything's super soap piped when I was there. It was like, when I was there, it was like, influence these people this way. And then... I, when I was there, there so you know, even, did you even know what, what the uh, sort of strategic or even the tactical impact of your missions were? Or did you just kind of like... Throw, yeah, we throw did, and then, like, for there. me, like, I'd, like, for me, I'd have to pay attention to, like, the information environment, and, like, you, and that was, like, where you'd be, like, oh, like, nothing fucking matters here, like, everything's just the same, no matter what we do, more or less, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> but also, like, how do you pull out? If you pull out, this is a power vacuum, then it's even fucking worse, yeah, like, I, I don't, like... It, it is, I mean, you know, we should, we should learn from the Russians there, that, because, you know, you, you get down near, like, uh, the Afghanistan-Pakistan border and stuff, and, and people who have been living in those villages have been living there for hundreds of years in the exact same way yeah. and outside yeah. of having like shortwave radios or whatever they're not they don't want to change you yeah. know they yeah. don't they they don't want democracy they don't want you know they, they don't even know what that is i mean no right, right? there's a study done a few years ago where it's like only like five percent of the population even knows what 9-11 was right yeah, yeah like they have no idea what right and, and, the, and yeah. the, the other thing is like it's when you when you try to appeal to any type of nationalist idea with them or national idea like they don't when they don't they don't see Afghanistan and Pakistan they know it exists they know there's yeah. a border yeah but but it's all tribal territory it's yeah. like you know if their tribe's territory uh, you know extends across the border that's their tribe's territory. Like, it has nothing to do yeah. with countries. They don't care what happens in Kabul. They have nothing to do with Afghanistan. They have, they are a country yeah. amongst themselves, yeah. you know. I don't, like, I don't even think they care about Taliban, even, like, the Taliban units. Yeah. It's more like, like, Taliban is more like a blanket term for, like, New York street gangs. Yeah. Like, they're, like, they're kind of interacting, but they're, like, their own little thing, and they don't really give a shit about the guy over here, and they're, maybe they'll kill him tomorrow, maybe they'll be his partner. Right, like, right. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. When you get into, I mean, just the blood feuds that have been going on, it's, I yeah. mean, it's like Hatfields and McCoy's almost everywhere you know, yeah, down there. Yeah, yeah. You know? So, yeah, it's 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 fascinating, and it, it's it, it's a very challenging operational environment in order, yeah. it, it, if you're looking, when it comes to looking at, like, 
how do we win? Like, how do you how do you define victory? Right, right. Yeah. You know, yeah. well, you know, we cleaned out the Taliban. Uh, you know, and and the and the AQ elements was that enough? I mean, Taliban isn't really anything that we can affect. Taliban is a cultural movement. You know, yeah. th- like that that's something that that the Afghan people are going to have to deal with because it, it doesn't matter if you go in and, and take Taliban territory. If you don't hold that territory, the Taliban's going to creep back in. You know, when you get yeah. down around Kandahar and things like that, there, there's nothing. Anytime there'd be a, a pause in our operations, every every game we had made oh, yeah. would yeah. just disappear. Yeah, we'd, we'd sit in briefings and they'd be like, you know, there's 15,000 Taliban in this region. We killed 3,000. <laughs> the next month, they'd be like, there's 15,000 Taliban in this region. We killed 3,000. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're just, you're just killing people all the time. And, like, the, like the net number of them isn't going down right. somehow. And, like, and, the, and the numbers don't even add up. It doesn't make fucking no, sense. No, and you're just like, right. what the fuck is this? What are, yeah. yeah. Well, it was the same thing in Iraq in, in 2009 where, or, shit, I mean, this is the entire global war on terror where it's like one unit would roll in and they'd be like, okay, this our host nation partner is red and we yeah. need to train them. And then by the end of the deployment, they're green and they're trained. Yeah. Then when the next unit comes in, they're red again. Oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and it's like we're just playing the same fucking game over yeah. and over again. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you, but by comparison to Iraq, you were saying that it's like you were actually clearing cities. Like you guys cleared through Ramadi, cleared through Mosul. Yeah, I've never felt like a huge sense of accomplishment. And like, that's a big I don't know, because there's a politi- there's like political issues with like SDF and like right, Turkey and whatnot. Right. But like you felt like. You were on the side of right. 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 Where Afghanistan, you were just like, fuck, man, I don't know. I'm just grinding yeah, That's a big fucking deal. Well, I got this got to do. Yeah. You and that, to have a sense of accomplishment. Like, yeah. I don't think, yeah. like, I mean, when we left in 05 and then when I left again in 09, I don't, I, yeah. I don't feel like we had a sense of accomplishment. I yeah. don't think that, like, I think the, the old adage was that, like, Iraq, we were winning when we left. Yeah. Like fucking. Like, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, we were up at the end of my yeah, shift, like, so uh, I, yeah. I, I got you here. It's yeah. Like, yeah. Fucking yeah. Drop the ball. Well, I mean, look. I mean, since since like World War Two, you know, we we no, you know, I mean, this is the same thing like the soldiers in Vietnam went through. It's like the, 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 there there's no armistice. There's no surrender. There's no the, there's, there's there's no formal declaration of victory. There's no point in time when we can say we won yeah yeah let's let's get everybody yeah. home bring the boys home we won what was that thing that the taliban used to say uh the taliban leadership that used to say uh, the american generals have all the watches but we have all the time yeah and it really yeah. made sense yeah. Like, uh, yeah and it's held true yeah. like yeah can, they could just wait us out yeah yeah you know? yeah we're iraq i'm not so sure like uh I don't know what Iraq's going to become. Mm, and, I can give you a hint. Yeah. <laughs> the little neighboring country next door has a lot of influence over there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the the governments are just going to completely, like, com- continue to roll over, I think, in Iraq for yeah. the next 25 years. Well, until yeah. until they get another strongman in. You know, until yeah. they get another strongman. Someone strong actually, arm, like, enforces you know, them. Another, yeah. another, and I don't, I don't mean somebody as horrible as Saddam, hopefully, but another Saddam, yeah. another Tito, another, another somebody who, yeah. you know, basically takes so, the reins. And, I mean, Iraq is kind of like this country that was cobbled together by the British Empire. Right, it, right. It, yeah. it, like, it does, it, not, it's very different than Afghanistan, but in the yeah. same way, like, is there such thing as like an Iraqi nationalist movement? No, I don't think, I mean, yeah. I mean look at fucking southern Baghdad. Southern yeah. Baghdad, you have like, uh, you have Christians that speak Aramaic. Mm-hmm. You have yeah. Shia neighborhoods. You have Sunni neighborhoods. All co-mingled. Like, they're all right there. You're going to tell me that these people are going to live peacefully amongst each other after all of our influence is out of there? No mm-hmm. fucking way. Yeah. The only you know, unified people in that area are the Kurds, and everyone else hates them. I mean, yeah. 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 yeah, right. They're a step well, the even, Jews. Even, so even, the Kurds, yeah. Even, even that's a misconception, though, because even the Kurds are not unified. Yeah. They look unified to Americans. Yeah. But internally, they're not. Yeah. yeah, you know, they're divided between PUK and KDP, and yeah. from there it goes off into like a dozen yeah. different factions. Honestly, I hate to but, say, but it. much better than than the Arabs. Yeah, for sure. I hate to yeah. say it because it blows my fucking mind. But like, maybe somebody like Maktoud al Sadr, who's apparently very fucking prominent in the Iraqi government now, like spending time in fucking Riyadh, like, which I can't yeah. fucking believe he's broken away from uh, Tehran. I, I mean, I'm surprised that he didn't get killed back in 2004, 2005. I am too, you know. But, but the thing is, is he, he 
and like every time, I, I, I have no idea how he survived in the sense of every time like U.S. forces would get a beat on that guy, all of a sudden we had another peace agreement with him. And, you know, like it was always like, you know, it, it's always like, you know, you, he punches and then when you go to punch him back, he goes, no, no, I'm sorry. Like, let, let's make peace. Yeah. It's like, yeah. okay, let's make peace. So you turn around and he punches you again. Yeah. It's like, what is going on here? <laughs> you you know? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's similar. You know, the, there, there's a very um, well understood dynamic that like Western states, particularly America in this case, like we like to address and talk to other states. And that goes to what you guys were saying about Afghanistan, that we want to turn it into the state, the nation of right. Afghanistan. Yeah, right. Like we wanted it to be like a mirror image of ourselves right. that we could then relate to. Right. And the same thing in Iraq. Like we wanted, it, I mean, it was a policy in 2009. Like we have to hold Iraq together as a yeah. state. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, ideally that would be great. Yeah. But yeah. maybe we should just pull the fucking Band-Aid off and accept it. Like, look, this is going to come through states. Like, it is what it is, and like we yeah. can control it. I mean, it's it basically if it we're set up into a, a system of tribal territories with you know the you know based you know on, on languages on on everything else like thousands they, of years. They, they they would be yeah. they would you know they would be much higher. It's, it's really interesting. There's an explorer and I, oh shit, a European guy uh, around like 1500. I can't remember his name offhand. Um, he, he traveled to Iraq amongst other places like during the Middle Ages and uh, and if you read his accounts it's fascinating because he records that there was like 200 mosques yeah. in Mosul or I'm sorry not mosques synagogues yeah like there was a, a prevailing <laughs> Jewish there population there was a huge Jewish population yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and like there is this um, the, the sort of prevalent uh, opinion or view of the Middle East that it has always been Sunni and Shia at war forever and there's never been these other um, dynamics, this sort of diversity of Jews and Christians, and like, no, that's not the case. Like, it, w it was very diverse. Well, I mean, not yeah. not only the Middle East, but I mean, uh, Afghanistan too. Afghanistan. Think of the the the, uh, the Buddhists, the Bamian mm -hmm. statues, and and, and yeah. fucking Jews. Yeah. yeah. Like, and, do you remember that? Do you ever heard the story about that last Jew in Afghanistan? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, they the last thing the Taliban did was they took his uh, Torah and they burned it in front of him. And they really? Killed him. Yeah. And he was like a ninety year old guy, like fucking like. Crazy shit, and the Jews yeah. have been around. Like, I mean, the Jews are everywhere, or they were everywhere. Yeah. We have tons of Jews in fucking Iran, and Syria, Syria, Iraq, yeah. and like, it's you know these were, I hate to say it, they were like somewhat diverse countries. Yeah, yeah. and like uh, even up to Bashir al-Assad in Syria, the Alawites. Yeah, the Alawites have uh, a lot of power. This yeah. this apocalyptic vision we have, or really, it's ISIS's vision. Of the Middle East, more than, more so than, than than ours or anyone else's, it's it's sort of ISIS's yeah, vision yeah. of the Middle East. It, I mean, that is not necessarily the truth of of Arab history or Middle Eastern history. It, it is, in some ways, it is a contemporary development. Yeah, I mean, the Christians were big time fans of Saddam Hussein. I met a bunch of Christians down in like <laughs> Southern Baghdad. They fucking were really upset when we took Saddam Hussein out. Well, because he was secular, you know. Because he yeah. didn't, he didn't, yeah. you know, he, like he was an asshole and he was yeah. a a murderous, horrible human being, but but he was equal opportunity. He was an equal <laughs> opportunity <laughs> asshole, you know. Well, that, I mean, that was the thing when I would talk to Iraqis in two thousand and four. I used to think that like they really meant this, and I go like, oh yeah, what do you think about Saddam? Oh fuck Saddam, Saddam, la Saddam. And back in when I got back there in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, and asked the same question, they go. Yeah, we miss him. Yeah, he wasn't so bad. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. He wasn't so bad. It's, it's, I mean, like, uh, all, you, know, you have to think back in time, and the, the massive criticisms about George W. Bush, and not to legitimize some of the, in my opinion, bad decisions he made, but um, in Iraq, I mean, maybe like 70% of the people there supported us sure. trusting yeah. Saddam. Sure. I mean, <laughs> he was not he was not well-liked. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but then everything that came after that, they were kind of like, why are you guys still here? Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. What? Yeah. Well, we mean, you know, I, I think obviously the, the, the invasion was not well thought out. When, you know, when you go into a country like that and, and remove a leader, um, and disband the army and disband the army, and you know, and, army. and, and the Bathus, like our Bathus purge was, was so mis, you know, misdirected like that. You take uh, all these sort of educated, influential, you know, all these people. Um, and yeah, the army, I mean, we should have just, I mean, dropped leaflets and said, stay in place, we're taking over your payroll. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. One hundred percent. They, you know, Paul Just Bremer. Know. Yeah, Paul Bremer is the fucking he, guy. Like he, 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 he fucked oh. guys like him and the, the yeah. people he surrounded himself with. Like, we're gonna disband the Bath Party. We're gonna disband the military. You That's, create an insurgency overnight. One, yeah, yeah, overnight. And not one person in the State Department, not one person in the CIA, could sit there and go, "Dude, do you realize what you're doing right now?" Right. All these guys tomorrow are gonna go home and they're gonna be pissed off because they don't have a job. Right. And they're gonna take their guns home. And they're going to have to figure out what they're going to do next. Yeah, right. And what they're going to do next is start targeting you because you fucked their look, life up. Look, this, this is like not widely understood by like John Q. Public, but those Bath Party people became the nucleus of ISIS. Right. Yeah. Like it turned into ISI, the Islamic... Uh, it, fuck, what was it? The, well, it was ISIS... Uh, no, no. no before, before it became ISIS, it was like the Islamic uh, or the fucking... It was that guy, the red-headed guy. Yeah, it was Al-Duri. Al yeah. And it was Saddam Hussein's daughter. Yeah. And it was a few other the Islamic people. something of Iraq. I, I, ISI. ISI. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And they that was the group we were fighting around like 2009 as we were pulling out of the country. That, that entity became ISIS. And, like, you don't have to take my word for it. You can go look at, like, the Brookings Institute uh, white papers that they wrote about it. And, like, the whole leadership cell of ISIS, they were all bath party people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's just, well, and then, you know, and then we have, you know, we, we can't learn our lesson. I mean, obviously we didn't because we should have learned in Iran, you know, when we took out Most the Shah. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 not the Shah, but uh, the, the king, right? And, um, um. Uh, and then you know, and then Obama and Hillary turn around and do it with Arab Spring, you know, and, and they did it with Gaddafi, it, it, yeah. yeah. And they, yeah. you know, it's like when are we going to learn our lesson? And it doesn't matter. And it, now that's the most dangerous country in the world, it, it, you know, that nobody wants to fucking talk about it except for him. Yeah, and fucking yeah. Libya is a fucking yeah. basket. Well, there's there's uh, there's an active there is an open air slave market in Tripoli. I mean, <laughs> come on, yeah. you know, yeah. like that's Hillary's legacy. Yeah. yeah. No, it really is. One hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. And if you say that you're, you're being political or whatever, but it's not true. Like that's just facts. Right. It's yeah. facts that like they decided to support the Arab Spring, instead of like seeing it out and not taking a side. Yeah. And then you have you know this whole ridiculous thing where we got to support democracy. We have democracy in fucking Egypt. And who gets elected to power? Right. Yeah, like, the Muslim, Muslim, yeah, a bunch of military yeah. dictators. Yeah, yeah. the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah, and we don't so, like that. So, so well, and, so, and yeah. what's, what's even funnier is, is you know, we have, we we have an ongoing arms deal with Egypt. We have like an order in process. It's like, oh, are we still shipping them these things? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, uh, that, that, those military assistance programs to Egypt are like so complicated. I don't think we could turn them off if we wanted to. Yeah, it, it's nuts. Who's the guy? El Sisi. The, the commanding general of the fucking uh, Egyptian military. Oh, Shady I know, as yeah. fuck. Like, and this is the guy, like, but it was so clear cut. We go, have to have democracy in Egypt. Yeah. For the first time. Yeah. The Muslim Brotherhood gets elected. Yeah. And we don't like that. So we're going to jail them all. And then we're going to have a special fucking, we're going to have a special election. And before we have a special election, then we're just going to have a military dictatorship. Come yeah. Out fucking... Yeah. Because we can't have a Muslim Brotherhood in fucking Egypt. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, get your questions in if you haven't already. Um, Chris wants to know, what are your opinions of battle space owners? Uh, like in Iraq or? You, you didn't specify. I guess just in general. I think it's situa uh, situationally dependent on where you are and who they are. Who, yeah. Who's the battle space owner? I mean... In my opinion, if it's fourth ID, not so great. <laughs> no. uh, if it's like third ID or tenth mountain, not so bad. Andrew asks, would it be useful practice for PSYOPs to give them the opportunity to demoralize, say, like an ROTC unit? Or a civil air patrol wing, <laughs> <laughs> like the prat, like like red team your own guys. But honestly, I don't think the U.S. military really needs psyops to demoralize them. I think we're pretty good at that all on our own. Uh, I like it. Um, how would you guys like working? How how did you guys like working with the State Department? I I can't really answer. I I never really worked with them. I got one quick great story about the State Department. So one of my big failed missions uh, that I put the kibosh on was a place called Gas Camp Village in southern Baghdad, like right outside of Fob Falcon. 
there was a whole entire village made of gas cans. And there really? was this really hot chick that worked for the mm-hmm. fucking State Department. It was well, the, the teams that they had put together, the, um, where they took military guys and like anthropologists and... Oh, fuck. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was that? It was like short-lived because it was a, a total debacle. Yeah. Oh, I can't remember the name. So I don't think like I didn't even hear about yeah, that. So yeah, it, it was, it was that, that was a big fucking CA thing, and that was like two thousand and eight. So the State Department put together a team. I think they actually had one CA guy in the unit or on the team, and then it would be like an anthropologist and a culture, uh, cultural support. Was it cultural support team? It was something like that. Yeah, it was cultural support team, and so there was one chick. In Iraq, she looked like Laura Croft. I don't know what she would look like. <laughs> and fucking, I wanted to fuck her so bad. And so my, my fucking commander was like, you go work with them and figure out what you're going to do. And I got this idea like, that I was going to create something really nice for Gas Can Village. And these people were literally living in huts made out of gas cans. I got a picture. I'll, I'll send it to you. Yeah, I'll love to see that. And so everybody from all the teams had to go up to Biop to learn how to drive fucking MRAPs because they were coming in the theater. And me and Cahill stayed at fucking Falcon. And we locked ourselves in the fucking talk because we had our own little compound on the backside. And I got some whiskey from my interpreters and we drank all night long watching Goodfellas and Godfather and all this shit. And the next fucking day I had to take her out to Gas Can Village. And she was so in love with the idea. I was like, yeah, we're going to bring fucking water in here. We're going to get a well in here. We're going to fucking get them electricity. I'll get generators or whatever. And she was so excited. I'm like, I'm totally going to fuck this chick. <laughs> <laughs> and my commander and everybody were like, all this about... This is how every great project gets done. <laughs> <laughs> this would have been the greatest... There's truth to that. This would have been the greatest CA fucking mission ever. Like, <laughs> and, like, fucking, like, and my commander, the, the Colonel, like, Colonel Jost... And Major Brockway and these guys were all behind it. We're like, do it, get it done. Are you fucking her? No. So I came <laughs> back and I set the whole fucking thing up. And she goes, Yeah, I don't think I need to be in Iraq anymore. I'm going to go back to California. I'm like, Ah, oh, it sucks. And she's like, But you better take care of Gas Can Village. And I'm like, Yeah, 100%. I'm going to go. <laughs> and like the next day, I'm like, Shh. <laughs> Fuck you guys. And like, fucking, like, so I'm sure there's just a bunch of people in Iraq right now still living in gas cans. With no running water. All no because you didn't get laid. Yeah. I mean, it would have been the greatest thing for these people. Yeah. If this chick banged me. <laughs> yeah. Their lives would have changed. Yeah. Kids would have been going to fucking You should have, you should have told her that before she went back to California. Yeah. In the face of Gas Can Village. Like, I mean. I, I have a story similar to that that doesn't involve me personally. Uh, a former colleague of mine. And it involves, like, there's an affair. There's Bo Bergdahl involved. There is just, like. Always the, strong. There's, there's like, like JSOC, DIA, <coughs> like it's all kinds of insane shit, and like all this stuff came together just because they were sleeping together. Yeah. Like, I, wait, are you gonna? Are I you, think are you just, are you just gonna tease us? I, with I'm this just or? gonna tease you because I can't, I can't go into the, I can't get into carnal knowledge. I think I know exactly what you're one. talking about. I, 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 maybe I can get him on here one day, but. Mm. Uh, this is gonna have it's to. It's a hell, it's a hell of a story. <laughs> uh. Uh, let's see here. Uh, State Department, it was the last mission because of your... <laughs> so it could have been good working with the State Department, but it didn't work out well. Guys, again, the PSA, uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for sticking with us. There's like 40 people watching this thing live. Um, you know, if you like what we're doing, you like the stream, please uh, click the link down in the description. And uh, if you want to support us financially, you know, you can. Uh, otherwise, you know, please remember to subscribe and hit that bell notification so that you get notified when we go live the next time. So thanks uh, for sticking around. We're we're up to uh, just over half of our rent right now on Patreon, right? Yes, yes, we are. So thank you, thank you very much for awesome. everybody who is is currently uh, donating. Uh, look, if you can afford two bucks a month, three bucks a month, whatever, uh, it it every little bit helps us. Every li- little bit helps us, and and we're paying for all this out of our pockets. So uh, yeah. No, I appreciate it. So, I mean, so hook a brother up. Yeah. I mean, it's really exciting, actually, to see how this thing's starting to gain some steam. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Andrew Dunbar asks, can I ask a pseudo-dumb question? Uh, if opium... So is pseudo-dumb, would that be fake-dumb? Anyway, uh, <laughs> if opium is a source by which the Taliban has been funding its insurgency, couldn't we just beat their price and buy directly from the farmers? 
Like I just say, legalize it in the states, and you don't have to worry about any of that anymore. In a sense, yeah. You know, like cartels, like opiate, like just legalize it, regulate it, tax it, and and all this all this crap goes away. Ooh, like we were yeah. talking about with the Mexican drug with cartels. The car- with the drug cartels. The insurgency well, like goes away. What I've seen away. in Afghanistan is like we like we we take away or we burn the opium fields, and we try to bring in another crop, and they're like, well, that doesn't make money. Yeah. So far, the, the thing is, like, well, that's not you're, that's you're not burning down. Possible, yeah, yeah. So fuck you. We're just gonna wait six months and plant it again. Yeah, you're you're burning yeah. down their fields, and some farmers like some farmers like, my, how am I gonna feed my family now? My, yeah. That's my income. It's like we present them with like a zero option. Yeah. Like, Here's this other crop, and they're like, that doesn't pay anything. Yeah. So we're right. just gonna wait it out for a little bit. Right. And, yeah. It's so like in, in Colombia. I mean, we you know understood that the the plan is to bring in good governance it's not just to like burn your fucking crops right yeah you yeah. know because weren't we doing some of that agent orange type bullshit yeah in as well yeah yeah like it has to i don't know <laughs> yeah they're they're yeah you gotta think about the second and third order fen- uh, events like yeah. You gotta, right yeah right and the thing is what are you gonna do you're gonna you're gonna post a fire guard on that field so he doesn't grow it again yeah. you know yeah. like it, yeah. it's like okay Flamethrower brigades. Yeah, right. Yeah, one right. Um, <laughs> At the least, actually, uh, so real quick, uh, I just want to point out that we have a legion in Hoboken, an American legion in Hoboken, and anybody from this area that's a veteran that wants to join, all I need is a copy of your DD-214, and Jack can put it out there how to get it to me. Yeah. And it's 35 bucks, and you can be a member and come to a really cool bar. You should... Uh, yeah, they, uh, they, they rebuilt the American legion after the... Um, Hurricane Sandy. After Hurricane Sandy came through and blasted everything out, so I mean, it's like what a four or five story building now. Yeah. And they have a brand new bar, and then in the top floors, it's housing for homeless veterans. So oh, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, it's a pretty cool thing they got going there. Do you have a website or do you have? Yeah, a- it's uh, Hoboken Legion Post One Hundred Seven. Hoboken Legion Post One Hundred Seven. We'll put that down in the link also. Uh, dot, dot com. Yeah. Yep. Uh, um, are you familiar with China Post One? No. Uh, is that the American Legion in the city? No, it's the American Legion that was in China. It was Flying Tigers. It was associated with like the old old Whoa. school. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, when um, when the revolution, when the Cultural Revolution happened, they um, they shut it down. They burned their books and kind of fled. But it's still... That's communism. It's, uh, <laughs> it's still in... Like, it basically, it's the only American Legion that's uh, posted. It's like sort of... An absentee, I guess. So, so you can petition for a charter. You can petition the American Legion for a charter. Usually, it's usually affiliated with like soft okay. stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So join, kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sign up. It's a cool bar. He's uh, a member. He's yeah. a member. Yeah. He's gonna be a member. Yeah. One hundred percent. Yep. Uh. What was the favorite thing you learned in training? Hmm. I don't know. I so I don't know. Like so, the PSYOP qualification course. It's you know, like it mimics the SFQ course a little bit, but like it, you have like tactical light and like You're physical basically light. You're SF. Don't lie. Basically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what I talk about light. It's basically all our rucks are heavier, and we yeah. go much farther. <laughs> right. You know. Um, but like so, like when you do like the. Like the tactical level, like KLE party and the key leader engagement training, they actually bring in real actors that just shit on you <laughs> and just like rip your arguments apart. And then, like, you're sitting there and there's like a bunch of like instructors there with notepads grading you, and you're supposed to look like you know what you're doing. This guy is just ripping you apart. That, uh, that was solid. Yeah. That was really solid training for me. Yeah, uh, and they're just like you're an American imperialist. You're here to oppress my people. So like you, you get like you get your little like your little KLE like note card, which is what they made for the senator that fucked everything up. And uh, like so you like, but you have to you have to show like the cadre that, like what your arguments are first, and they clearly share it with this guy. And then he just sits there, and it's like it's like a week of you just getting shit on. <laughs> it's really good. So you're trying to basically convince him or, or... Of fucking anything. Yeah. And he has all of the points against you. He knows what you're coming in with. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. That was good. And, and what, like, what did you get out of that? 
Just or do like, you just enjoy being shit on? I mean, I, 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 I just. <laughs> I think it's that's just. Like, not I'm judging. judging. That's, that's, a, that's a fetish. That's a fetish. And no, like, you just have to, like, learn how to, like, persevere and be, like, okay with being wrong because you can set up a next meeting right. and come back. Right. And you just have to be like, all right, I fucked this up bad. Yeah. Give me a minute. Well, let's let's, re- yeah. let's yeah. reconvene in Pause. two days. Yeah. yeah, and like you just had to learn how to like deal with that. Because yeah. like no matter what, you were gonna they were gonna give you shit like facts the first time around. Anyways, like so you were coming in wrong, right? And then you had to come back the next time and like try to like fix it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like one of those like ego checks where you're just like, okay, I fucked this one up, but now yeah. I can plan for the next time, yeah. and I can convince you in the next conversation. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Because, I mean, no matter what, you're coming in to lose. But, like, you didn't really know, like, like, you didn't really know that that well. Like, you just came in, like, it, it's, I don't know, I haven't ever been grading you there, and then, like, the guy's way more prepared than you are. Like, you just, like, you suck. And then, you, like, you come back later, and you get to, like, kind of, like, recover. It's basically the, uh, why isn't it coming to my mind right now? This is going to kill me. The, um, the scenario on Star Trek, the, uh, where you can't win, the, uh, Oh, where, where Kirk was supposed to kill the guy? And he no, no, it's, it's, yeah, but it, no, it's the ships. It's, it's, it's when they're in the training academy. Oh, the, the yeah. Kobayashi. The, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Kobayashi, uh, the, uh, was it the, the exercise? Kobayashi Maru? Yeah. And he hacks the, he hacks the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a little no-win situation. Anyway, nice. Yeah. It, it is Kobayashi Maru, right, guys? Some, some, somebody out there is as <laughs> is, is nerdy as me. I Some, know. Someone out there knows that. I mean, yeah. there's always somebody watching that knows, and like, like Frank Bruno here, the thing we were talking about, the human terrain teams. Oh, yeah, HCT. That's what it was. Yeah. Uh, Josh, what about you? What was your favorite part of training? What, what was the thing? You know what? Uh, for me, it was a guy who was an old Green Beret that was an instructor there that kind of taught me that no matter where you are or who you sit down with, never refuse like food or drink or anything like that. Because it's like the best way to ingratiate yourself with the person that brings yeah. you into their house. Yeah, true. And as, dis- yeah. as disgusting as the food may be, you know, you can see a bunch of Iraqis putting their hands in the same pot or yeah. whatever. The fact that you'll put your hand in the pot and you'll eat that food with them, it, the, the amount of wasta, remember that word yeah. wasta? Yeah. The wasta you can get out of that is better than anything else. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's ingratiating and it puts you on the same level as them. And it, it, it's a big deal. It might not be a big deal here. Yeah. But in a place like Iraq or even in Congo, it's a big fucking deal. Yeah. yeah. And I ate some really nasty shit and I shit my brains out. Yeah. But good things happened because of it. If you're like one of those people that's like a racist or a xenophobe or something like that, like you need to find another job. Or, yeah. or, yeah. or, yeah. or a really picky eater, honestly. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or a vegan. Yeah. Yeah. I ate some fucking awesome food in Iraq. It yeah. was like, it was all like, Organic. It was all fresh. Yep. It was all you know made by you know locals. Yeah. There would be a few times that I went into like villages and shit, and I ate stuff where I knew I was going to get sick, and I had Cipro, and I could take that if I had to. But the thing that was a real squeamish thing for me was watching like everybody put their hands in there before I got in. Right. It's like you couldn't say no. I, yeah. I, I yeah. eat some food in Africa, like a plate that I think, like you, you know exactly what you're talking about. Like it's a big plate of yeah. food with the bread, was... with the like the with the bread underneath, like the Ethiopian and, type of and chicken yeah, and yeah. rice, yeah, the brown rice, and I think it was left out for a day or two, yeah. and uh, yeah, that put me on my ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but at the end of the day, it works for you. Yeah, yeah, it just it makes you stronger too. Like it builds that immune system. Yeah, it builds character. I, I actually I love character. the food in like Afghanistan. I like the food in Iraq Dude, too. Dude, the yeah. fucking chai, the chai. Oh, the chai is amazing. And you've got a question where that water comes from, but like sometimes you get a good cup of chai. Yeah. And you're tired. Dude, yeah. Oh. The, I would tell you the story. We did a uh, like five or six day recon patrol out in the deserts. It's like northwestern Iraq. It's an area called the Jazera um, between Tel Afar and, and Syria. Yeah. And yeah, you know that area? Yeah. And there's it's just a, an archipelago of little villages out yeah. there. Um, and for so it's the Jazera. The Jazera is a, uh, it means an island. Yeah. Uh, so why is the desert called an island? I asked the people there. They have no fucking idea. But, yeah. Okay. We're moving on from that. Uh, <laughs> but I went into one of these villages um, to meet with. Uh, it was it was uh, with a worse unit, and we met with a Mukhtar, and we're sitting down talking, and it's just hot as 
fuck out. You know how it is. It's yeah. Iraq. It's like 90, 100 degrees out in this desert. Even, even more? E- yeah. e- even, this was like in the, getting into the winter months. Or something. Okay. Yeah. It was cold at night. Right. It was hot during the day. And um, a little kid comes around with a kettle of like ice cold water and like pours the water for all of us. Mm-hmm. And like without thinking about it for a second, I was like, oh, cold water and drank yeah. it. And I think I drank two or three cups actually as the little kid came around. Um, and yeah, that was not <laughs> yeah. advisable. Yeah. There's a thing like when the, when the kid comes around with the water or it comes around with the chai, when you're done, you're supposed to yeah. shake the glass. You're supposed to do like one of these numbers to let them know you're done. And if you don't, you just hold the cup like that. You just, just give it, it to yeah. yeah. So like I've had like 10 cups of chai before, but before I picked up on what the hell yeah. was going on. Yeah. So we had a bunch of operations in like the Jazzy area, or Jazeera, and uh, I, I was working with this Korean guy, and I guess in Korean, Jazzy is like slang for dick. So all the operation names were like Jazzy something. <laughs> like so, so he was always just giggling at me. We were like, "What the fuck, dude?" And he was like, "It's Dick Storm, Dick Thunder." Like. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. Yeah. Long live the coalition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, did any of anybody serve with uh, Jocko Willink in Iraq? No. No. That's the uh, nope. seal, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, uh, no. Uh, he's he, uh, he's got like a big time podcast, I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do a show about the conflict in Ukraine. Mm, one day. What if the Laura Croft woman, instead of wanting to... Oh, that question doesn't make sense, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell what? you what, she was hot. She was definitely hot. Yeah. No. What are the... She was America hot. She wasn't just Iraq hot. Like wearing a plate carrier with like five, five, six bags She would wear it. like super tight 5'11 pants and, you know, like a crop top. Tell me fucking, more. Yeah. <laughs> she just was like... Desire to know more intensifies. She like really liked me. And I was like, maybe she didn't like me the way that I thought she liked me. But oh, I was you, didn't, just, you didn't get like the, the digits? I mean, you didn't like... No, I was, I was sitting there trying to save the world. And like, uh, I, I guess I didn't save it quick enough. And she had to go back to America. And then those poor bastards in fucking Gascan Village. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sit there fucking, they're probably sitting there right now waking up. Probably watching, probably watching our live stream and going, that motherfucker. And we'll find that, <laughs> that fucking info one day. Where, Where did he break? say that? Where did he say that, uh, that he post was? He generated. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are uh, the number one most effective CA and PSYOPs missions of the, uh, the Global War on Terror? I, I, honestly, that, that you might not be able to. You guys might. I don't know if they were classified or not. So. No, I. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of weird. Like, uh, probably for CA something in Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be. Iraq wouldn't have anything good. Push for Psy for psyop. Like a lot of psyop units work on like pro democracy stuff and get people to show up and vote. I mean, probably something yeah. along those lines, but I don't, I don't really know. It's a lame answer. So that's what you get, two lame answers. Yeah. <laughs> or a lame yeah. answer or nothing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's about it, I think. Yeah, for, thanks, for everybody. That. We really appreciate it. Thanks to our guests, uh, Josh and Zach, yeah, for man. being here. We really appreciate yeah, it, guys. I mean, I'll give you guys, like, one or two minutes if, if you have a, a final question to get in, but um, we've been fucking rolling for, like, two hours now, yeah. so... That's a pretty good show. And, you know, I'm really glad, you know, it's funny that for years, years at this point, I've had people asking me, like, can you interview CA and PSYOPs yeah. guys? And for some fucking reason, it's like easier to interview a command sergeant major from Delta Force than it is to interview <laughs> you guys. And, like, I've had, like, crazy email chains with, like, all these people up and down and SWIC and everything yeah. and CA and PSYOPs and never managed to actually, like, get one of you guys on. So to have the two of you on here at the same time is yeah, awesome. great. Yeah, that's great. I'm yeah. really glad because I've, like, interviewed everyone else in special operations, like, from front to back. Yeah. And then done it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's still have had CA psyops guys on. Have you guys yeah. had like uh, <clears throat> like sore guys on or? 
not uh, he may have on on I, uh, yeah on his previous yeah uh, but not not on this particular live stream but I mean that's all in the uh, in the works yeah you know Dave got everything working so that we can have people um, on Skype dial in remote yeah that's right so. uh, our Skype it seems to be up and running we're going to do a couple of test runs it's coming so it is it is on the way so on that note actually uh, next week we're going to have in studio guests again. And it's going to be the authors of these uh, military fiction series, Andrews and Wilson, from I think this is the Tier 1 series. Uh, both of these authors are going to be here in the studio next week. Let me hold it up so people can see. Um, so that's next week's show. And then the week after that, uh, my friend Jason is going to be on. He was a former CIA operations he's officer. He's an operations officer in the CIA. So he's going to be in the week after that. So yeah. we have in-studio guests for the next two weeks. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll take it from there and see uh, what happens. Jason is the big uh, guy yeah. that from... You want to say the big black guy? I know. <laughs> I know. I know. It's other than you're talking. You guys sit at, your, uh, at my table at your wedding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice guy. Good guy. Smart guy. Well, yeah. J Jason's a really good guy. I've yeah. known him for, uh, for a while now since... 2013, 2012, 2013. I've known him for a while now. Um, so yeah, he'll be here. We'll have him in studio. We'll have a good conversation. He's gonna. Have, he has some really funny stories yeah. to tell. <laughs> yeah. and he, he was a Marine, and uh, and then he went on to the agency, and uh, and he still works for our government. Yeah. 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 Uh, Andrew. Okay, Andrew. Maybe getting back to us with a with a more reasonable question. What if the Laura Croft woman, instead of wanting to saving, save the gas can people, wanted this dude to just loot Iraqi antiquities smuggling out of the country? <laughs> At the time, I would have done it for her. <laughs> <laughs> I would have done fucking it. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It was like, the difference between like, jerking off in a fucking porta potty or fucking banging a pretty decent looking chick. Yeah. So, yes, answer, the answer is I would have fucking done anything. Except after she left, I would not help the Cascan Village. Yeah. Poor bastards. <laughs> <laughs> Here's to you, Gas Can Village. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, bro. Here's to these guys. Sorry, bro. <laughs> uh, nice people, though. <laughs> <laughs> the entire fucking Iraq War summed up that uh. story. <laughs> All right. All right, guys. Uh, that's our show. So uh, thank you very much once again for uh, joining us. Uh, thanks again to uh, Josh and Zach. Uh, remember, uh, one more time with the, uh... Hoboken American Legion Post 107. And the website? Uh, Hoboken American Legion Post 107.com. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. one or some. And I'm a member, Josh is, what's your official title over there? Facilities Manager, 4th in Command. Okay. Yeah, well, and then... And Zach I'll is remember. a member also? Yep. Yeah. And... Next week he is. And I'll be a member? Yep. Can yeah. I sign up online? Yeah. I'll sign up tonight. Just a copy of your DD-214 and $35 check or uh, money order or PayPal. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And it really is, like, because uh, I've been there a couple of times now, I mean, it is, like, a super cool bar that you guys put together over there. Yeah. Um, and I actually wrote a story about it. People want to go check that out. Um, but also, I mean, it, it's, like, it, it's interesting that there's, yeah, the social aspect of it, of getting, like, veterans together, but also, like, you guys are trying to, like, do something for the community, and you're trying to, like, do yeah. something for homeless veterans, so yep. it's, like, the two things combined in one. Is there, is there, uh, is that a, that same site, if they wanted to donate to the shelter or something like that, is there a spot for that? So, right now, we have, uh, six units for homeless veterans. Okay. Uh, but next year, we're going to have 15 more. Can I have one? Yeah, yeah dude, <laughs> dude, wait till you see these fucking units. Really? Like, oh my God. I'm, I'm in. These are I'm like thirty four hundred dollars. I've products. seen them. They are very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's nice. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not like quote unquote homeless shelter. It's yeah. like an actual yeah, apartment. No, it's yeah. like a either a studio apartment or a one bedroom apartment. Yeah, fully furnished. That's fantastic. In a yeah. brand new building. Yeah, like controlled at the door. Like where you have to like put a key fob to get in. That's amazing. It's yeah. really so. Is there a place where people can donate for that or? Yeah, right on the website. Right on the website. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, thanks again, guys. We appreciate it. Um, did it all for the nookie, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tried. <laughs> all right. Until next time. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>